Mark Twain's Journal Writings, Volume 3, Section 1. Mark Twain Buying Gloves in Gibraltar. A very handsome young lady in the store offered me a pair of blue gloves. I did not want blue, but she said they would look very pretty on a hand like mine. The remark touched me tenderly. I glanced furtively at my hand, and somehow it did seem rather a comely member. I tried a glove on my left, and blushed a little. Manifestly the size was too small for me, but I felt gratified when she said, Oh, it is just right, yet I knew it was no such thing. I tugged at it diligently, but it was discouraging work. She said, Ah, I see you are accustomed to wearing kid gloves, but some gentlemen are so awkward about putting them on. It was the last compliment I had expected. I only understand about putting on the buckskin article perfectly. I made another effort, and tore the glove from the base of the thumb into the palm of the hand, and tried to hide the rent. She kept up her compliments, and I kept up my determination to deserve them or die. Ah, you have had experience, a rip down the back of the hand. They are just right for you. Your hand is very small. If they tear, you need not pay for them. A rent across the middle. I can always tell when a gentleman understands putting on kid gloves. There is a grace about it that only comes with long patience. The whole afterguard of the glove fetched away, as the sailors say. The fabric parted across the knuckles, and nothing was left but a melancholy ruin. I was too much flattered to make an exposure and throw the merchandise on the angel's hands. I was hot, vexed, confused, but still happy. But I hated the other boys for taking such an absorbing interest in the proceedings. I wished they were in Jericho. I felt exquisitely mean when I said cheerfully, This one does very well. It fits elegantly. I like a glove that fits. No, uh, never mind, ma'am, never mind. I'll put the other on in the street. It is warm here. It was warm. It was the warmest place I ever was in. I paid the bill, and, as I passed out with a fascinating bow, I thought I detected a light in the woman's eye that was gently ironical and when I looked back from the street, and she was laughing to herself about something or other, I said to myself with withering sarcasm, Oh, certainly. You know how to put on kid gloves, don't you? A self-complacent ass, ready to be flattered out of your senses by every petticoat that chooses to take the trouble to do it. End of Mark Twain Buying Gloves in Gibraltar Read by John Greenman Mark Twain's Journal Writings, Volume 3, The Great Revolution in Pitcairn. Let me refresh the reader's memory a little. Nearly a hundred years ago, the crew of the British ship Bounty mutinied, set the captain and his officers adrift upon the open sea, took possession of the ship, and sailed southward. They procured wives for themselves among the natives of Tahiti then proceeded to a lonely little rock in mid-Pacific called Pitcairn's Island, wrecked the vessel, stripped her of everything that might be useful to a new colony, and established themselves on shore. Pitcairn's is so far removed from the track of commerce that it was many years before another vessel touched there. It had always been considered an uninhabited island. So, when a ship did at last drop its anchor there, in 1808, the captain was greatly surprised to find the place peopled. Although the mutineers had fought among themselves and gradually killed each other off until only two or three of the original stock remained, these tragedies had not occurred before a number of children had been born. So, in 1808, the island had a population of twenty-seven persons. John Adams, the chief mutineer, still survived, and was to live many years yet as governor and patriarch of the flock. From being mutineer and homicide, he had turned Christian and teacher. 
and his nation of twenty-seven persons was now the purest and devoutest in Christendom. Adams had long ago hoisted the British flag, and constituted his island an appanage of the British crown. Today the population numbers ninety persons, sixteen men, nineteen women, twenty-five boys, and thirty girls, all descendants of the mutineers, all bearing the family names of those mutineers, and all speaking English, and English only. The island stands high up out of the sea, and has precipitous walls. It is about three-quarters of a mile long, and in places is as much as half a mile wide. Such arable land as it affords is held by the several families, according to a division made many years ago. There is some livestock, goats, pigs, chickens, and cats, but no dogs, and no large animals. There is one church building, used also as a capital, a schoolhouse, and a public library. The title of the governor has been, for a generation or two, magistrate and chief ruler, in subordination to Her Majesty the Queen of Great Britain. It was his province to make the laws as well as execute them. His office was elective. Everybody over seventeen years old had a vote no matter about the sex. The sole occupations of the people were farming and fishing, their sole recreation, religious services. There has never been a shop in the island, nor any money. The habits and dress of the people have always been primitive, and their laws simple to puerility. They have lived in a deep Sabbath tranquillity, far from the world and its ambitions and vexations, and neither knowing nor caring what was going on in the mighty empires that lie beyond their limitless ocean solitudes. Once in three or four years a ship touched there, moved them with aged news of bloody battles, devastating epidemics, fallen thrones, and ruined dynasties, then traded them some soap and flannel for some yams and breadfruit, and sailed away, leaving them to retire into their peaceful dreams and pious dissipations once more. On the 8th of last September, Admiral de Horsey, commander-in-chief of the British fleet in the Pacific, visited Pitcairn's Island, and speaks as follows in his official report to the Admiralty. They have beans, carrots, turnips, cabbages, and a little maize pineapples, fig-trees, custard-apples, and oranges, lemons and coconuts. Clothing is obtained alone from passing ships in barter for refreshments. There are no springs on the island, but as it rains generally once a month, they have plenty of water, although at times in former years they have suffered from drought. No alcoholic liquors, except for medicinal purposes, are used, and a drunkard is unknown. The necessary articles required by the islanders are best shown by those we furnished in barter for refreshments, namely flannel, serge, drill, half-boots, combs, tobacco, and soap. They also stand much in need of maps and slates for their school, and tools of any kind are most acceptable. I caused them to be supplied from the public stores with a Union Jack, for display on the arrival of ships, and a pit-saw, of which they were greatly in need. This, I trust, will meet the approval of their lordships. If the munificent people of England were only aware of the wants of this most deserving little colony, they would not long go unsupplied. Divine service is held every Sunday at 10.30 a.m. and at 3 p.m., in the house built and used by John Adams for that purpose, until he died in 1829. It is conducted strictly in accordance with the liturgy of the Church of England, by Mr. Simon Young, their selected pastor, who is much respected. A Bible class is held every Wednesday, when all who conveniently can attend. There is also a general meeting for prayer on the first Friday in every month. Family prayers are said in every house the first thing in the morning and the last thing in the evening, and no food is partaken of without asking God's blessing before and afterward. Of these islanders' religious attributes no one can speak without deep respect. 
a people whose greatest pleasure and privilege is to commune in prayer with their god and to join in hymns of praise and who are moreover cheerful diligent and probably freer from vice than any other community need no priest among them now i come to a sentence in the admiral's report which he dropped carelessly from his pen no doubt and never gave the matter a second thought he little imagined what a freight of tragic prophecy it bore this is the sentence one stranger an american has settled on the island a doubtful acquisition a doubtful acquisition indeed captain ornsby in the american ship hornet touched at pitcairns nearly four months after the admiral's visit and from the facts which he gathered there we now know all about that american let us put these facts together in historical form the american's name was butterworth staveley as soon as he had become well acquainted with all the people and this took but a few days of course he began to ingratiate himself with them by all the arts he could command he became exceedingly popular and much looked up to for one of the first things he did was to forsake his worldly way of life and throw all his energies into religion he was always reading his bible or praying or singing hymns or asking blessings in prayer no one had such liberty as he no one could pray so long or so well at last when he considered the time to be ripe he began secretly to sow the seeds of discontent among the people it was his deliberate purpose from the beginning to subvert the government but of course he kept that to himself for a time he used different arts with different individuals he awakened dissatisfaction in one quarter by calling attention to the shortness of the sunday services he argued that there should be three three-hour services on sunday instead of only two many had secretly held this opinion before they now privately banded themselves into a party to work for it he showed certain of the women that they were not allowed sufficient voice in the prayer meetings thus another party was formed no weapon was beneath his notice he even descended to the children and awoke discontent in their breasts because as he discovered for them they had not enough sunday school this created a third party now as the chief of these parties he found himself the strongest power in the community so he proceeded to his next move a no less important one than the impeachment of the chief magistrate james russell nicoy a man of character and ability and possessed of great wealth he being the owner of a house with a parlor to it three acres and a half of yam land and the only boat in pitcairns a whaleboat and most unfortunately a pretext for this impeachment offered itself at just the right time one of the earliest and most precious laws of the island was the law against trespass it was held in great reverence and was regarded as the palladium of the people's liberties about thirty years ago an important case came before the courts under this law in this wise a chicken belonging to elizabeth young aged at that time fifty-eight a daughter of john mills one of the mutineers of the bounty trespassed upon the grounds of thursday october christian aged twenty-nine a grandson of fletcher christian one of the mutineers christian killed the chicken according to the law christian could keep the chicken or if he preferred he could restore its remains to the owner and receive damages in produce to an amount equivalent to the waste and injury wrought by the trespasser the court records set forth that the said christian aforesaid did deliver the aforesaid remains to the said elizabeth young and did demand one bushel of yams in satisfaction of the damage done but elizabeth young considered the demand exorbitant the parties could not agree therefore christian brought suit in the courts he lost his case in the judge's court at least he was awarded only a half peck of yams which he considered insufficient and in the nature of a defeat he appealed the case lingered several years in an ascending grade of courts and always resulted in decrees sustaining the original verdict and finally the thing got into the supreme court and there it stuck for twenty years but last summer 
even the supreme court managed to arrive at a decision at last once more the original verdict was sustained christian then said he was satisfied but staveley was present and whispered to him and to his lawyer suggesting as a mere form that the original law be exhibited in order to make sure that it still existed it seemed an odd idea but an ingenious one so the demand was made a messenger was sent to the magistrate's house he presently returned with the tidings that it had disappeared from among the state's archives the court now pronounced its late decision void since it had been made under a law which had no actual existence great excitement ensued immediately the news swept abroad over the whole island that the palladium of the public liberties was lost maybe treasonably destroyed within thirty minutes almost the entire nation were in the courtroom that is to say the church the impeachment of the chief magistrate followed upon staveley's motion the accused met his misfortune with the dignity which became his great office he did not plead or even argue he offered the simple defense that he had not meddled with the missing law that he had kept the state archives in the same candle-box that had been used as their depository from the beginning and that he was innocent of the removal or destruction of the lost document but nothing could save him he was found guilty of misprision of treason and degraded from his office and all his property was confiscated the lamest part of the whole shameful matter was the reason suggested by his enemies for his destruction of the law to wit that he did it to favor christian because christian was his cousin whereas staveley was the only individual in the entire nation who was not his cousin the reader must remember that all these people are the descendants of half a dozen men that the first children intermarried together and bore grandchildren to the mutineers that these grandchildren intermarried after them great and great great grandchildren intermarried so that today everybody is blood kin to everybody moreover the relationships are wonderfully even astoundingly mixed up and complicated a stranger for instance says to an islander you speak of that young woman as your cousin a while ago you called her your aunt well she is my aunt and my cousin too and also my stepsister my niece my fourth cousin my thirty-third cousin my forty-second cousin my great-aunt my grandmother my widowed sister-in-law and next week she will be my wife so the charge of nepotism against the chief magistrate was weak but no matter weak or strong it suited staveley staveley was immediately elected to the vacant magistracy, and oozing reform from every pore he went vigorously to work in no long time religious services raged everywhere and unceasingly by command the second prayer of the sunday morning service which had customarily endured some thirty-five or forty minutes and had pleaded for the world first by continent and then by national and tribal detail was extended to an hour and a half and made to include supplications in behalf of the possible peoples in the several planets everybody was pleased with this everybody said now this is something like by command the usual three-hour sermons were doubled in length the nation came in a body to testify their gratitude to the new magistrate the old law forbidding cooking on the sabbath was extended to the prohibition of eating also by command sunday school was privileged to spread over into the week the joy of all classes was complete in one short month the new magistrate had become the people's idol the time was ripe for this man's next move he began cautiously at first to poison the public mind against england he took the chief citizens aside one by one and conversed with them on this topic presently he grew bolder and spoke out he said the nation owed it to himself to its honor to its great traditions to rise in its might and throw off this galling english yoke but the simple islanders answered we had not noticed that it galled how does it gall 
England sends a ship once in three or four years to give us soap and clothing, and things which we sorely need and gratefully receive, but she never troubles us. She lets us go our own way. She lets you go your own way. So slaves have felt and spoken in all the ages. This speech shows how fallen you are, how base, how brutalized you have become under this grinding tyranny. What, has all manly pride forsaken you? Is liberty nothing? Are you content to be a mere appendage to a foreign and hateful sovereignty when you might rise up? and take your rightful place in the august family of nations great free enlightened independent the minion of no sceptred master but the arbiter of your own destiny and a voice and a power in decreeing the destinies of your sister sovereignties of the world speeches like this produced an effect by and by citizens began to feel the english yoke they did not know exactly how or whereabouts they felt it, but they were perfectly certain they did feel it. They got to grumbling a good deal and chafing under their chains, and longing for relief and release. They presently fell to hating the English flag, that sign and symbol of their nation's degradation. They ceased to glance up at it as they passed the capital, but averted their eyes and grated their teeth and one morning, when it was found trampled into the mud at the foot of the staff, they left it there, and no man put his hand to it to hoist it again. A certain thing which was sure to happen sooner or later happened now. Some of the chief citizens went to the magistrate by night and said, We can endure this hated tyranny no longer. How can we cast it off? By a coup d'etat. How? A coup d'etat. It is like this. Everything is got ready, and at the appointed moment I, as the official head of the nation, publicly and solemnly proclaim its independence, and absolve it from allegiance to any and all other powers whatsoever. Now that sounds simple and easy. We can do that right away. Then what will be the next thing to do? Seize all the defenses and public properties of all kinds, establish martial law, put the army and navy on a war footing, and proclaim the empire. This fine program dazzled these innocents. They said, This is grand! This is splendid! Uh, but will not England resist? Let her. This rock is a Gibraltar. True. But what about the empire? Do we need an empire and an emperor? What you need, my friends, is unification. Look at Germany. Look at Italy. They are unified. Unification is the thing. It makes living dear. That constitutes progress. We must have a standing army and a navy. Taxes follow as a matter of course. All these things summed up make grandeur. With unification and grandeur, what more can you want? Very well. Only the Empire can confer these boons. So, on the eighth day of December, Pitcairn's Island was proclaimed a free and independent nation, and on the same day the solemn coronation of Butterworth I, Emperor of Pitcairn's Island, took place, amid great rejoicings and festivities. The entire nation, with the exception of fourteen persons, mainly little children, marched past the throne in single file with banners and music, the procession being upward of ninety feet long, and some said it was as much as three-quarters of a minute passing a given point. Nothing like it had ever been seen in the history of the island before. Public enthusiasm was measureless. Now straightway imperial reforms began. Orders of nobility were instituted. A minister of the navy was appointed, and the whale-boat put in commission. A minister of war was created and ordered to proceed at once with the formation of a standing army. A first lord of the treasury was named, and commanded to get up a taxation scheme, and also open negotiations for treaties, offensive, defensive, and commercial, with foreign powers. Some generals and admirals were appointed, also some chamberlains, some equerries-in-waiting, and some lords of the bedchamber. 
at this point all the material was used up the grand duke of galilee minister of war complained that all the sixteen grown men in the empire had been given great offices and consequently would not consent to serve in the ranks wherefore his standing army was at a standstill the marquis of ararat minister of the navy made a similar complaint he said he was willing to steer the whaleboat himself but he must have somebody to man her the emperor did the best he could in the circumstances he took all the boys above the age of ten years away from their mothers and pressed them into the army thus constructing a corps of seventeen privates officered by one lieutenant general and two major generals this pleased the minister of war but procured the enmity of all the mothers in the land for they said their precious ones must now find bloody graves in the fields of war and he would be answerable for it some of the more heartbroken and unappeasable among them lay constantly wait for the emperor and threw yams at him unmindful of the bodyguard on account of the extreme scarcity of material it was found necessary to require the duke of bethany postmaster-general to pull a stroke oar in the navy and thus sit in the rear of a noble of lower degree namely viscount canaan lord justice of the common pleas this turned the duke of bethany into tolerably open malcontent and a secret conspirator a thing which the emperor foresaw but could not help things went from bad to worse the emperor raised nancy peters to the peerage on one day and married her the next notwithstanding for reasons of state the cabinet had strenuously advised him to marry emmeline eldest daughter of the archbishop of bethlehem this caused trouble in a powerful quarter the church the new empress secured the support and friendship of two-thirds of the thirty-six grown women in the nation by absorbing them into her court as maids of honor but this made deadly enemies of the remaining twelve the families of the maids of honor soon began to rebel because there was nobody at home to keep house the twelve snubbed women refused to enter the imperial kitchen as servants so the empress had to require the countess of jericho and other great court dames to fetch water sweep the palace and perform other menial and equally distasteful services this made bad blood in that department everybody fell to complaining that the taxes levied for the support of the army the navy and the rest of the imperial establishment were intolerably burdensome and were reducing the nation to beggary the emperor's reply look look at germany look at italy are you better than they and haven't you unification did not satisfy them they said people can't eat unification and we are starving agriculture has ceased everybody is in the army everybody is in the navy everybody is in the public service standing around in a uniform with nothing whatever to do nothing to eat and nobody to till the fields look at germany look at italy it is the same there such is unification and there's no other way to get it no other way to keep it after you've got it said the poor emperor always but the grumblers only replied we can't stand the taxes we can't stand them now right on top of this the cabinet reported a national debt amounting to upward of forty-five dollars half a dollar to every individual in the nation and they proposed to fund something they had heard that this was always done in such emergencies they proposed duties on exports also on imports and they wanted to issue bonds also paper money redeemable in yams and cabbages in fifty years they said the pay of the army and of the navy and of the whole governmental machine was far in arrears and unless something was done and done immediately national bankruptcy must ensue and possibly insurrection and revolution the emperor at once resolved upon a high-handed measure and one of a nature never before heard of in pitcairn's island he went in state to the church on sunday morning with the army at his back and commanded the minister of the treasury to take up a collection that was the feather that broke the camel's back first one citizen and then another rose and refused to submit to this unheard-of outrage and each refusal was followed by the immediate confiscation of the malcontents property 
This vigor soon stopped the refusals, and the collection proceeded amid a sullen and ominous silence. As the emperor withdrew with the troops, he said, I will teach you who is master here. Several persons shouted, Down with unification! They were at once arrested and torn from the arms of their weeping friends by the soldiery. But in the meantime, as any prophet might have foreseen, a social democrat had been developed. As the emperor stepped into the gilded imperial wheelbarrow at the church door, the social democrat stabbed at him fifteen or sixteen times with a harpoon. But fortunately, with such a peculiarly social democratic unprecision of aim as to do no damage. That very night the convulsion came. The nation rose as one man, though forty-nine of the revolutionists were of the other sex. The infantry threw down their pitchforks, the artillery cast aside their coconuts, the navy revolted, the emperor was seized, and bound hand and foot in his palace. He was very much depressed. He said, I freed you from a grinding tyranny. I lifted you up out of your degradation, and made you a nation among nations. I gave you a strong, compact, centralized government. And, more than all, I gave you the blessing of blessings, unification. I have done all this, and my reward is hatred, insult, and these bonds. Take me, do with me as you will. I here resign my crown and all my dignities, and gladly do I release myself from this too heavy burden. For your sake I took them up, for your sake I lay them down. The imperial jewel is no more. Now bruise and defile as ye will the useless setting." By a unanimous voice the people condemned the ex-emperor and the social democrat to perpetual banishment from church services, or to perpetual labor as galley-slaves in the whaleboat, whichever they might prefer. The next day the nation assembled again, and re-hoisted the British flag, reinstated the British tyranny, reduced the nobility to the condition of commoners again, and then straightway turned their diligent attention to the weeding of the ruined and neglected yam-patches, and the rehabilitation of the old useful industries, and the old healing and solacing pieties. The ex-emperor restored the lost trespass law, and explained that he had stolen it not to injure any one, but to further his political projects. Therefore the nation gave the late chief magistrate his office again, and also his alienated property. Upon reflection, the ex-emperor and the social democrat chose perpetual banishment from religious services, in preference to perpetual labor as galley-slaves with perpetual religious services, as they phrased it. Wherefore the people believed that the poor fellow's troubles had unseated their reason, and so they judged it best to confine them for the present, which they did. Such is the history of Pitcairn's double acquisition. End of the Great Revolution in Pitcairn by Mark Twain, read by John Greenman. A Gift from India by Mark Twain, as printed in The Critic. Also appearing in The Critic, Mark Twain on the Platform, and editorial comments about Mark Twain's wealth, and an announcement concerning Mark Twain's authorship of Personal Recollections of Joan of Arc. We have received from Mark Twain the following letter in reference to the offer of the Maharaja of Jaipur to present copies of the Jaipur portfolios of architectural details to public institutions of learning. We append a description of the contents of the portfolios, and give also a portrait of the Maharaja. Dear Gilder, Colonel Jacob has done this great work for love, and has been at it several years, although his official duties allow him but scant time for other matters. The King of Jaipur, native title Maharaja, has taken a strong interest in this rich gift to the architectural world, and has freely furnished the money necessary to the achievement. 
the drawings were all made under colonel jacob's superintendence by young natives they are pupils in the schools of art and protégés of the maharaja in the case of the sculptured adornments of tombs and mosques a peculiar method was adopted to secure accuracy sheets of soft india paper were wetted and then beaten into the sculptures with a brush when dry these sheets retained the sculptured shapes like an electrolyte skin the shapes were then traced with a soft pencil and the pencil works transferred to flat paper by pressure then the patterns were inked and shaded there was nothing further to do but reduce them by photography and reproduce them for the book by photolithography these six parts are a rich mine indeed for the architect and decorator the intricate and exquisite forms and patterns invented by the artists of the great days of the mogul empire are here in abundance not as pictures for the ignorant to look at but as working drawings of separate details for the student the architect the decorator the artisan to study copy and apply in his work it is not a work for the drawing-room but for the art school and the atelier its purpose is utilitarian the design in view is to place the noble and gracious architecture of old india in hands capable of enriching newer worlds with it and thus preserving it for it is passing away time and neglect are delivering it to destruction and there can be no resurrection for it here for the circumstances which created it and made it possible will have no rebirth in india with a fine liberality the maharaja proposes to give this costly book to public institutions and my idea in writing this note is to convey that fact to our art schools and universities in america i quote his highness the maharaja of jaipur has given permission to present a set of the first six parts to any public institution that applies for it for bona fide public use if the applicants defray cost of carriage only and packing r s one dash eight that is one rupee eight annas about forty two cents note we presume this refers to cost of carriage from india to london to america there would probably be a slight additional charge editors critic they can apply to w griggs and sons elm house hanover street rye lane peckham london and i would suggest and recommend that they send a courteous word of thanks to his highness the maharaja jaipur rajpurtana jaipur india twelve march eighteen ninety six mark twain jaipur portfolios of architectural details compiled chiefly from old buildings at or near delhi agra and parts of rajputana with short descriptive notes of the places from which they have been taken the size of each plate of first six parts is twenty two by fifteen inches and of part seven eighteen inches by thirteen inches the details have been reproduced to a large scale so as not only to be interesting to the student but chiefly to serve as working drawings for the architect and artisan the arrangement of the portfolios is as follows part one copings and plinths fifty two plates comprising a hundred and twelve examples of copings and twenty of plinths part two pillars caps and bases seventy nine plates comprising one hundred and fifty eight examples viz one hundred and twenty seven of pillars and thirty one of bases one in color part three carved doors sixty six plates eleven representing inlaid ivory work printed in color comprising twenty seven doors sixty eight panels and seventy four other details part four brackets sixty nine plates two colored comprising eighty six examples part five arches fifty eight plates of which ten are colored part six balustrades fifty plates comprising fifty one examples one in color 
many of the panels are filled with tracery part seven string and band patterns sixty four plates comprising three hundred and twenty six examples seventy five in color all taken from native buildings in india the drawings have all been carefully done to scale and arranged together in parts each sheet loose so that different examples of architectural details may be readily compared and selections made most of these details are taken from buildings erected when the mogul dynasty was at its zenith and will be found beautiful in design rich in detail and at the same time applicable to many purposes in wood stone or metal the price of the above six parts each in strong cloth portfolio containing in all three hundred and seventy four plates with about six hundred and fifty four examples will be net r s seventy five packing charges extra part seven only price r s twenty five in india packing charges extra price one pound ten shillings in england the first six parts will not be sold separately only the seventh part a further series including the following is also in hand wall decoration including dados wall recesses and panels cornice and ceiling decoration parapets projecting eaves and finials these will be issued in portfolio parts as soon as complete the work has been prepared under the superintendence of colonel s s jacob c i e engineer to the jaipur state rajputana and the plates photolithographed by w griggs and sons elm house hanover street rye lane peckham from whom complete sets of six parts can be obtained for five pounds and part seven only for thirty shillings Copies can be had on application to the superintending engineer, Jaipur State, Rajputana. Mark Twain on the Platform The Sketch Unfortunately, perhaps, for himself, but decidedly fortunately for the people who have the pleasure of listening to him, Mark Twain has been dragged out of his American study by pecuniary losses to the footlights of the lecture platform, and the admiring gaze of his multitudinous readers it is quite twenty years since the author of huck finn spoke across the footlights and even at that distant date his lectures were very few in number so that the people who have seen or heard the humorist in public prior to his present lecturing tour must be very limited indeed perhaps it is a good thing that mark twain has been compelled to take to lecturing for a time as it will enable him to visit countries previously unknown to him, and, as he has already promised, result in Tramp Abroad, Volume 2, being published. In fact, Mark Twain has so arranged his tour that he will not revisit any of the countries which formed such excellent scope for witty observation in his well-known book. Mark Twain placed himself unreservedly under the care of that well-known colonial lecture agent, Mr. R. S. Smythe, who has negotiated so many big stars through the colonies. Crossing from San Francisco, the humorist opened his tour in Sydney in the middle of September. His tour, which will last a year, extends over all the Australian colonies, New Zealand, Mauritius, Ceylon, and South Africa. He had an offer of two thousand pounds for ten lectures in London, but for the present had to refuse it. He will finish his colonial tour and get the resultant book off his hands before thinking of a trip to England. As a lecturer, or rather storyteller, for the author objects to being called a lecturer, Mark Twain is, and has proved himself to be, in his opening Australian At Homes, a decided success. Like Charles Dickens, he relies entirely on his old books for the pabulum of his discourses, but, unlike the author of Pickwick, he does not read long extracts from these books. He takes some of his best stories, The Jumping Frog, Huck Finn, The Difficulties of the German Language, par exemple, and retells them, with many subtle additions of humor and some fresh observations, in the most irresistibly amusing manner. He is in no sense a disappointment as a humorist he starts his audience laughing in the very first sentence he utters 
and for two hours keeps them in a continual roar. The only serious moments occur when, with the unutterable pathos of which the true humorist alone is capable, he interpolates a few pathetic touches which almost make the tears mingle with the smiles. Every story he tells serves the purpose of illustrating a moral, and although for the most part he talks in low, slow, conversational tones, at times he rises to real bursts of eloquence, not the polished, grand eloquent eloquence of the average American speaker, but the eloquence conveyed in simple words and phrases, and prompted by some deep and sincerely felt sentiment. The author has the power of seeming to jest at his serious side, just as in his books, but there is no mistaking the seriousness with which, for example, he is moved by the remembrance of the iniquities perpetrated on liberty in the old slavery days amid which Huck Finn and Jim the Slave lived. He makes the most unexpected anecdotes point the most unexpected morals, but it is the recital of the old familiar stories without any moral attaching to them which pleases most, coming as they do warm from the brain of the man who invented them. Mark Twain steals unobtrusively on to the platform, dressed in the regulation evening clothes, with the trouser pockets cut high up, into which he occasionally dives both hands. He bows with a quiet dignity to the roaring cheers which greet him at every at home. Then, with natural, unaffected gesture, and with scarcely any prelude, he gets under way with his first story. He is a picturesque figure on the stage. His long, shaggy white hair surmounts a face full of intellectual fire. The eyes, arched with bushy brows, and which seem to be closed most of the time while he is speaking, flash out now and then from their deep sockets with a genial, kindly, pathetic look, and the face is deeply drawn with the furrows accumulated during an existence of sixty years. He talks in short sentences, with a peculiar smack of the lips at the end of each. His language is just that of his books, full of the quaintest Americanisms, and showing an utter disregard for the polished diction of most lecturers. It was not, is always, twarn't, with Mark Twain, and mighty fine, and my kingdom, and they done it, and catched, and various other purely transatlantic words and phrases crop up profusely during his talk. He speaks slowly, lazily, and wearily, as a man dropping off to sleep, rarely raising his voice above a conversational tone. But it has that characteristic nasal sound which penetrates to the back of the largest building. His figure is rather slight, not above middle height, and the whole man suggests an utter lack of physical energy. As a matter of fact, Mark Twain detests exercise, and the attraction must be very strong to induce him to go very far out of doors. Rolf Boulderwood called on him in Melbourne, and had the greatest difficulty in the world to persuade him to take a drive. With the exception of an occasional curious trot, as when recounting his buck-jumping experiences, Mark Twain stands perfectly still in one place during the whole of the time he is talking to the audience. He rarely moves his arms, unless it is to adjust his spectacles or to show by action how a certain thing was done. His characteristic attitude is to stand quite still, with the right arm across the abdomen and the left resting on it and supporting his chin. In this way he talks on for nearly two hours, and while the audience is laughing uproariously, he never by any chance relapses into a smile. To have read Mark Twain is a delight, but to have seen and heard him is a joy not readily to be forgotten. The humorist is accompanied on his tour by his wife and charming second daughter. R. C. B. The Tribune says, It may not be generally known that Mr. Charles Henry Webb was Mr. Clemens' first publisher, evidence of which is found in a volume still extant, but bringing much beyond the published price, entitled 
the celebrated jumping frog of calaveras county and other sketches by mark twain edited by john paul published by c h webb it is also interesting to know that that book was refused by three leading publishers of the day eighteen sixty eight to whom it was offered mr clemens wrote to mr webb from darjeeling india on february sixteenth i and the family have finished our duties and pleasures here and are returning to calcutta we have lectured and seen the himalayan mountain that is twenty nine thousand feet high and have met a man who conversed with a man who knows the man who saw a tiger come out of the jungle yesterday and eat a friend of his who had just put on his breech clout and was starting out to pay calls we expect to see that tiger to-day for we have to pass right by that spot and he will probably want some more the announcement of mark twain's authorship of personal recollections of joan of arc is officially made in the sketch of mr clemens by his friend and pastor the rev joseph h twichell of hartford with which the may number of harper's magazine opens the frontispiece of the number is a portrait of mark twain engraved from his latest photograph and the paper is illustrated with sketches by child hassam of the home of the humorist at hartford and his study at elmira end of a gift from india and editorial comments from the critic saturday april twenty fifth eighteen ninety six read by john greenman from india to south africa the diary of a voyage by mark twain author of the innocents abroad adventures of tom sawyer etc a truthful captain whom nobody would believe and a fabling passenger whom nobody would discredit a steamship library perfect in its omissions the advantages of living away from mauritius barnum's purchase of shakespeare's birthplace one there are no people who are quite so vulgar as the over-refined ones pudd'nhead wilson's new calendar we sailed from calcutta toward the end of march stopped a day at madras two or three days in ceylon then sailed westward on a long flight for mauritius from my diary april seventh we are far abroad upon the smooth waters of the indian ocean now it is shady and pleasant and peaceful under the vast spread of the awnings and life is perfect again ideal the difference between a river and the sea is that the river looks fluid the sea solid usually looks as if you could step out and walk on it the captain has this peculiarity he cannot tell the truth in a plausible way in this he is the very opposite of the austere scot who sits midway of the table he cannot tell a lie in an unplausible way when the captain finishes a statement the passengers glance at each other privately as who should say do you believe that when the scot finishes one the look says how strange and interesting the whole secret is in the manner and method of the two men the captain is a little shy and diffident and he states the simplest fact as if he were a little afraid of it while the scot delivers himself of the most abandoned lie with such an air of stern veracity that one is forced to believe it although one knows it isn't so for instance the scot told about a pet flying fish he once owned that lived in a little fountain in his conservatory and supported itself by catching birds and frogs and rats in the neighboring fields it was plain that no one at the table doubted this statement by and by in the course of some talk about custom-house annoyances the captain brought out the following simple everyday incident but through his infirmity of style managed to tell it in such a way that it got no credence he said i went ashore at naples one voyage when i was in that trade and stood around helping my passengers for i could speak a little italian two or three times at intervals the officer asked me if i had anything dutiable about me and seemed more and more put out and disappointed every time i told him no 
finally a passenger whom i had helped through asked me to come out and take something i thanked him but excused myself saying that i had taken a whiskey just before i came ashore it was a fatal admission the officer at once made me pay sixpence import duty on the whiskey just from ship to shore you see and he fined me five pounds for not declaring the goods another five pounds for falsely denying that i had anything dutiable about me also five pounds for concealing the goods and fifty pounds for smuggling which is the maximum penalty for unlawfully bringing in goods under the value of seven pence apenny altogether sixty-five pounds sixpence for a little thing like that the scot is always believed yet he never tells anything but lies whereas the captain is never believed although he never tells a lie so far as i can judge if he should say his uncle was a male person he would probably say it in such a way that nobody would believe it at the same time the scot could claim that he had a female uncle and not stir a doubt in anybody's mind my own luck has been curious all my literary life i never could tell a lie that anybody would doubt nor a truth that anybody would believe lots of pets on the board birds and things in these far countries the white people do seem to run remarkably to pets our host in cawnpore had a fine collection of birds the finest we saw in a private house in india and in colombo dr murray's great compound and commodious bungalow were well populated with domesticated company from the woods frisky little squirrels a ceylon mina walking sociably about the house a small green parrot that whistled a single urgent note of call without motion of its beak also chuckled a monkey in a cage on the back veranda and some more out in the trees also a number of beautiful macaws in the trees and various and sundry birds and animals of breeds not known to me but no cat yet a cat would have liked that place april ninth tea planting is the great business in ceylon now a passenger says it often pays forty per cent on the investment says there is a boom april tenth the sea is a mediterranean blue and i believe that that is about the divinest color known to nature it is strange and fine nature's lavish generosities to her creatures at least to all of them except man for those that fly she has provided a home that is nobly spacious a home which is forty miles deep and envelops the whole globe and has not an obstruction in it for those that swim she has provided a more than imperial domain which is miles deep and covers three-fifths of the globe but as for man she has cut him off with the mere odds and ends of the creation she has given him the thin skin the meagre skin which is stretched over the remaining two-fifths the naked bones stick up through it in most places on the one half of this domain he can raise snow ice sand rocks and nothing else so the valuable part of his inheritance really consists of but a single fifth of the family estate and out of it he has to grub hard to get enough to keep him alive and provide kings and soldiers and powder to extend the blessings of civilization with yet man in his simplicity and complacency and inability to cipher thinks nature regards him as the important member of the family in fact her favorite surely it must occur to even his dull head sometimes that she has a curious way of showing it afternoon the captain has been telling how in one of his arctic voyages it was so cold that the mate's shadow froze fast to the deck and had to be ripped loose by main strength and even then he got only about two-thirds of it back nobody said anything and the captain went away i think he is becoming disheartened also to be fair there is another word of praise due to this ship's library it contains no copy of the vicar of wakefield that strange menagerie of complacent hypocrites and idiots of the theatrical cheap john heroes and heroines who are always showing off 
of bad people who are not interesting and good people who are fatiguing a singular book not a sincere line in it and not a character that invites respect a book which is one long waste-pipe discharge of goody-goody puerilities and dreary moralities a book which is full of pathos which revolts and humor which grieves the heart there are few things in literature that are more piteous more pathetic than the celebrated humorous incident of moses and the spectacles jane austen's books too are absent from this library just that one omission alone would make a fairly good library out of a library that hadn't a book in it customs in tropic seas at five in the morning they pipe to wash down the decks and at once the ladies who are sleeping there turn out and they and their beds go below then one after another the men come up from the bath in their pajamas and walk the decks an hour or two with bare legs and bare feet coffee and fruit served the ship eat and her kitten now appear and get about their toilets next the barber comes and flays us on the breezy deck breakfast at nine thirty and the day begins i do not know how a day could be more reposeful no motion a level blue sea nothing in sight from horizon to horizon the speed of the ship furnishes a cooling breeze there is no mail to read and answer no newspapers to excite you no telegrams to fret you or fright you the world is far far away it has ceased to exist for you seemed a fading dream along in the first days has dissolved to an unreality now it is gone from your mind with all its businesses and ambitions its prosperities and disasters its exultations and despairs its joys and griefs and cares and worries they are no concern of yours any more they have gone out of your life they are a storm which has passed and left a deep calm behind the people group themselves about the decks in their snowy white linen and read smoke sew play cards talk nap and so on in other ships the passengers are always ciphering about when they are going to arrive out in these seas it is rare very rare to hear that subject broached in other ships there is always an eager rush to the bulletin board at noon to find out what the run has been in these seas the bulletin seems to attract no interest i have seen no one visit it in thirteen days i have visited it only once then i happened to notice the figures of the day's run on that day there happened to be talk at dinner about the speed of modern ships i was the only passenger present who knew this ship's gait necessarily the atlantic custom of betting on the ship's run is not a custom here nobody ever mentions it i myself am wholly indifferent as to when we are going to get in if any one else feels interested in the matter he has not indicated in my hearing if i had my way we should never get in at all this sort of sea life is charged with an indestructible charm there is no weariness no fatigue no worry no responsibility no work no depression of spirits there is nothing like this serenity this comfort this peace this deep contentment to be found anywhere on land if i had my way i would sail on forever and never go to live on the solid ground again one of kipling's ballads has delivered the aspect and sentiment of this bewitching sea correctly the injun ocean sets and smiles so soft so bright so bloomin blue there aren't a wave for miles and miles except the jiggle from the screw april fourteenth it turns out that the astronomical apprentice worked off a section of the milky way on me for the magellan clouds a man of more experience in the business showed one of them to me last night it was small and faint and delicate and looked like the ghost of a bunch of white smoke left floating in the sky by an exploded bombshell wednesday april fifteenth mauritius arrived and anchored off port louis two a m 
rugged clusters of crags and peaks green to their summits from their bases to the sea a green plain with just tilt enough to it to make the water drain off i believe it is in fifty-six east and twenty-two south a hot tropical country the green plain has an inviting look has scattering dwellings nestling among the greenery scene of the sentimental adventure of paul and virginia island under french control which means a community which depends upon quarantines for its health not upon sanitation thursday april sixteenth went ashore in the forenoon at port louis a little town but with the largest variety of nationalities and complexions we have encountered yet french english chinese arabs africans with wool blacks with straight hair east indians half whites quadroons and great varieties in costumes and colors took the train for cure pipe at one thirty two hours run gradually uphill what a contrast this frantic luxuriance of vegetation with the arid plains of india these architecturally picturesque crags and knobs and miniature mountains with the monotony of the indian dead levels a native pointed out a handsome swarthy man of grave and dignified bearing and said in an awed tone that is so-and-so has held office of one sort or another under this government for thirty-seven years he is known all over this whole island and in the other countries of the world perhaps who knows one thing is certain you can speak his name anywhere in this whole island and you will find not one grown person that has not heard it it is a wonderful thing to be so celebrated yet look at him it makes no change in him he does not even seem to know it cure pipe means pincushion or peg town probably sixteen miles two hours by rail from port louis at each end of every roof and on the apex of every dormer window a wooden peg two feet high stands up in some cases its top is blunt in others the peg is sharp and looks like a toothpick the passion for this humble ornament is universal apparently there has been only one prominent event in the history of mauritius and that one didn't happen i refer to the romantic sojourn of paul and virginia here it was that story that made mauritius known to the world made the name familiar to everybody the geographical position of it to nobody a clergyman was asked to guess what was in a box on a table it was a vellum fan painted with the shipwreck and was one of virginia's wedding gifts april eighteenth this is the only country in the world where the stranger is not asked how do you like this place this is indeed a large distinction here the citizen does the talking about the country himself the stranger is not asked to help you get all sorts of information from one citizen you gather the idea that mauritius was made first and then heaven and that heaven was copied after mauritius another one tells you that this is an exaggeration that the two chief villages port louis and cure pipe fall short of heavenly perfection that nobody lives in port louis except upon compulsion and that cure pipe is the wettest and rainiest place in the world an english citizen said in the early part of this century mauritius was used by the french as a basis from which to operate against england's indian merchantmen so england captured the island and also the neighbor bourbon to stop that annoyance england gave bourbon back the government in london did not want any more possessions in the west indies if the government had had a better quality of geography in stock it would not have wasted bourbon in that foolish way a big war will temporarily shut up the suez canal some day and the english ships will have to go to india around the cape of good hope again then england will have to have bourbon and will take it mauritius was a crown colony until twenty years ago with a governor appointed by the crown and assisted by a council appointed by himself but pope hennessy came out as governor then 
and he worked hard to get a part of the council made elective and succeeded so now the whole council is french and in all ordinary matters of legislation they vote together and in the french interest not the english the english population is very slender it has no votes enough to elect a legislator half a dozen rich french families elect the legislature pope hennessy was an irishman a catholic a home ruler m p a hater of england and the english a very troublesome person and a serious encumbrance at westminster so it was decided to send him out to govern unhealthy countries in the hope that something would happen to him but nothing did the first experiment was not merely a failure it was more than a failure he proved to be more of a disease himself than any he was sent to encounter the next experiment was here the dark scheme failed again it was an off-season and there was nothing but measles here at the time pope hennessy's health was not affected he worked with the french and for the french and against the english and he made the english very tired and the french very happy and lived to have the joy of seeing the flag he served publicly hissed his memory is held in worshipful reverence and affection by the french it is a land of extraordinary quarantines they quarantine a ship for anything or nothing quarantine her for twenty and even thirty days they once quarantined a ship because her captain had had the smallpox when he was a boy that and because he was english the population is very small small to insignificance the majority is east indian then mongrels then negroes descendants of the slaves of the french times then french then english there was an american but he is dead or mislaid the mongrels are the result of all kinds of mixtures black and white mulatto and white quadroon and white octoroon and white and so there is every shade of complexion ebony old mahogany horse chestnut sorrel molasses candy clouded amber clear amber old ivory white new ivory white fish belly white this latter the leprous complexion frequent with the anglo-saxon long resident in tropical climates you wouldn't expect a person to be proud of being a mauritian now would you but it is so the most of them have never been out of the island and haven't read much or studied much they think the world consists of three principal countries judea france and mauritius so they are very proud of belonging to one of the three grand divisions of the globe they think that russia and germany are in england and that england does not amount to much they have heard vaguely about the united states and the equator but they think both of them are monarchies they think mount peter bot is the highest mountain in the world and if you show one of them a picture of milan cathedral he will swell up with satisfaction and say that the idea of that jungle of spires was stolen from the forest of peg-tops and toothpicks that makes the roofs of cure-pipe look so fine and prickly there is not much trade in books the newspapers educate and entertain the people mainly the latter they have two pages of large print reading matter one of them english the other french the english page is a translation of the french one the typography is super extra primitive in this quality it has not its equal anywhere there is no proofreader now he is dead where do they get matter to fill up a page in this little island lost in the wastes of the indian ocean oh madagascar they discuss madagascar and france that is the bulk then they choke up the rest with advice to the government also slurs upon the english administration the papers are all owned and edited by creoles french the language of the country is french everybody speaks it has to you have to know the french particularly mongrel french the patois spoken by tom dick and harry of the multiform complexions or you can't get along this was a flourishing country in former days for it made then and still makes the best sugar in the world but first the suez canal severed it from the world and left it out in the cold and next the best root sugar helped by bounties 
captured the European markets. Sugar is the life of Mauritius, and it is losing its grip. Its downward course was checked by the depreciation of the rupee, for the planter pays wages in rupees, but sells his crop for gold, and the insurrection in Cuba and paralyzation of the sugar industry there have given our prices here a life-saving lift. But the outlook has nothing permanently favorable about it. It takes a year to mature the canes, on the high ground three and six months longer, and there is always a chance that the annual cyclone will rip the profit out of the crop. In recent times a cyclone took the whole crop, as you may say, and the island never saw a finer one. Some of the noblest sugar estates in the island are in deep difficulties. A dozen of them are investments of English capital, and the companies that own them are at work now trying to settle up and get out with a saving of half the money they put in. You know, in these days, when a country begins to introduce the tea culture, it means that its own specialty has gone back on it. Look at Bengal. Look at Ceylon. Well, they've begun to introduce the tea culture here. Many copies of Paul and Virginia are sold every year in Mauritius. No other book is so popular here, except the Bible. By many it is supposed to be a part of the Bible. All the missionaries work up their French on it when they come here to pervert the Catholic mongrel. It is the greatest story that was ever written about Mauritius, and the only one. 2. The principal difference between a cat and a lie is that the cat has only nine lives. Puddenhead Wilson's New Calendar. April 20th. The cyclone of 1892 killed and crippled hundreds of people. It was accompanied by a deluge of rain which drowned Port Louis and produced a water famine. Quite true, for it burst the reservoir and the water pipes and for a time after the flood had disappeared there was much distress from want of water. This is the only place in the world where no breed of matches can stand the damp. Only one match in sixteen will light. The roads are hard and smooth. Some of the compounds are spacious, some of the bungalows commodious, and the roadways are walled by tall bamboo hedges, trim and green and beautiful and there are azalea hedges too, both the white and the red. I never saw that before. As to healthiness, I translate from today's, April 20th, Merchants and Planters Gazette, from the article of a regular contributor, Carminge, concerning the death of the nephew of a prominent citizen. Sad and lugubrious existence, this which we lead in Mauritius, I believe there is no other country in the world where one dies more easily than among us. The least indisposition becomes a mortal malady. A simple headache develops into meningitis, a cold into pneumonia, and presently, when we are least expecting it, death is a guest in our house. This daily paper has a meteorological report which tells you what the weather was day before yesterday. One is never pestered by a beggar or a peddler in this town, so far as I can see. This is pleasantly different from India. April 22nd. To such as believe that the quaint product called French civilization would be an improvement upon the civilization of New Guinea and the like, the snatching of Madagascar and the laying on of French civilization there will be fully justified. But why did england allow the french to have madagascar did she respect a theft of a couple of centuries ago dear me robbery by european nations of each other's territories has never been a sin is not a sin today to the several cabinets the several political establishments of the world are clotheslines and a large part of the official duty of these cabinets is to keep an eye on each other's wash and grab what they can of it, as opportunity offers. All the territorial possessions of all the political establishments in the earth, including America, of course, consist of pilferings from other people's wash. No tribe, howsoever insignificant, and no nation, howsoever mighty, occupies a foot of land that was not stolen. 
when the english the french and the spaniards reached america the indian tribes had been raiding each other's territorial clotheslines for ages and every acre of ground in the continent had been stolen and re-stolen five hundred times the english the french and the spaniards went to work and stole it all over again and when that was satisfactorily accomplished they went diligently to work and stole it from each other in europe and asia and africa every acre of ground has been stolen several millions of times a crime persevered in a thousand centuries ceases to be a crime and becomes a virtue this is the law of custom and custom supersedes all other forms of law christian governments are as frank today as open and above board in discussing projects for raiding each other's clotheslines as ever they were before the golden rule came smiling into this inhospitable world and couldn't get a night's lodging anywhere in one hundred and fifty years england has beneficently retired garment after garment from the indian lines until there is hardly a rag of the original wash left dangling anywhere in eight hundred years an obscure tribe of muscovite savages has risen to the dazzling position of land robber in chief she found a quarter of the world hanging out to dry on a hundred parallels of latitude and she scooped in the whole wash she keeps a sharp eye on a multitude of little lines that stretch along the northern boundaries of india and every now and then she snatches a hip rag or a pair of pajamas it is england's prospective property and russia knows it but russia cares nothing for that in fact in our day land robbery claim jumping is become a european governmental frenzy some have been hard at it in the borders of china in burma in siam and the islands of the sea and all have been at it in africa Africa has been as coolly divided up and portioned out among the gang as if they had bought it and paid for it, and now, straightway, they are beginning the old game again, to steal each other's grabbings. Germany found a vast slice of Central Africa with the English flag, and the English missionary and the English trader scattered all over it, but with certain formalities neglected, no signs up, keep off the grass, trespassers forbidden, etc., and she stepped in with a cold calm smile and put up the signs herself and swept those english pioneers promptly out of the country there is a tremendous point there it can be put into the form of a maxim get your formalities right never mind about the moralities it was an impudent thing but england had to put up with it now in the case of madagascar the formalities had originally been observed but by neglect they had fallen into desuetude ages ago england should have snatched madagascar from the french clothesline without an effort she could have saved those harmless natives from the calamity of french civilization and she did not do it now it is too late the signs of the time show plainly enough what is going to happen all the savage lands in the world are going to be brought under subjection to the christian governments of europe I am not sorry, but glad. This coming fate might have been a calamity to those savage peoples two hundred years ago, but now it will in some cases be a benefaction. The sooner the seizure is consummated, the better for the savages. The dreary and dragging ages of bloodshed and disorder and oppression will give place to peace and order and the reign of law when one considers what india was under her hindu and mohammedan rulers and what she is now when he remembers the miseries of her millions then and the protections and humanities which they enjoy now he must concede that the most fortunate thing that has ever befallen that empire was the establishment of british supremacy there the savage lands of the world are to pass to alien possession their peoples to the mercies of alien rulers let us hope and believe that they will all benefit by the change april twenty third the first year they gather shells the second year they gather shells and drink the third year they do not gather shells said to immigrants to mauritius what there is of mauritius is beautiful 
you have undulating wide expanses of sugar-cane a fine fresh green and very pleasant to the eye and everywhere else you have a ragged luxuriance of tropic vegetation of vivid greens of varying shades a wide tangle of underbrush with graceful tall palms lifting their plumes high above it and you have stretches of shady dense forest with limpid streams frolicking through them continually glimpsed and lost and glimpsed again in the pleasantest hide-and-seek fashion and you have some tiny mountains some quaint and picturesque groups of toy peaks and a dainty little vest-pocket matterhorn and here and there and now and then a strip of sea with a white ruffle of surf breaks into the view that is mauritius and pretty enough the details are few the massed result is charming but not imposing not riotous not exciting it is a sunday landscape perspective and the enchantments wrought by distance are wanting there are no distances there is no perspective so to speak fifteen miles as the crow flies is the usual limit of vision mauritius is a garden and a park combined it affects one's emotions as parks and gardens affect them the surface of one's spiritual deeps are pleasantly played upon the deeps themselves are not reached not stirred spaciousness remote altitudes the sense of mystery which haunts apparently inaccessible mountain domes and summits reposing in the sky these are the things which exalt the spirit and move it to see visions and dream dreams the sandwich islands remain my ideal of the perfect thing in the matter of tropical islands i would add another story to mauna loa's sixteen thousand feet if i could and make it particularly bold and steep and craggy and forbidding and snowy and i would make the volcano spout its lava floods out of its summit instead of its sides but aside from these non-essentials i have no corrections to suggest i hope these will be attended to i do not wish to have to speak of it again three when your watch gets out of order you have choice of two things to do throw it in the fire or take it to the watch tinker the former is the quickest pudd'nhead wilson's new calendar the arundel castle is the finest boat i have seen in these seas she is thoroughly modern and that statement covers a great deal of ground she has the usual defect the common defect the universal defect the defect that has never been missing from any ship that ever sailed she has imperfect beds many ships have good beds but no ship has very good ones in the matter of beds all ships have been badly edited ignorantly edited from the beginning the selection of the beds is given to some hearty strong-backed self-made man when it ought to be given to a frail woman accustomed from girlhood to backaches and insomnia nothing is so rare on either side of the ocean as a perfect bed nothing is so difficult to make some of the hotels on both sides provide it but no ship ever does or ever did in noah's ark the beds were simply scandalous noah set the fashion and it will endure in one degree of modification or another till the next flood eight a m passing isle de bourbon broken up skyline of volcanic mountains in the middle surely it would not cost much to repair them and it seems inexcusable neglect to leave them as they are it seems stupid to send tired men to europe to rest it is no proper rest for the mind to clatter from town to town in the dust and cinders and examine galleries and architecture and be always meeting people and lunching and teeing and dining and receiving worrying cables and letters and a sea voyage on the atlantic is of no use voyage too short sea too rough the peaceful indian and pacific oceans and the long stretches of time are the healing thing may second a m a fair great ship in sight almost the first we have seen in these weeks of lonely voyaging last night the burly chief engineer middle-aged 
was standing telling a spirited seafaring tale and had reached the most exciting place where a man overboard was washing swiftly astern on the great seas and uplifting despairing cries everybody racing aft in a frenzy of excitement and fading hope when the band which had been silent a moment began impressively its closing piece the english national anthem as simply as if he was unconscious of what he was doing he stopped his story uncovered laid his laced cap against his breast and slightly bent his grizzled head the few bars finished he put on his cap and took up his tale again as naturally as if that interjection of music had been a part of it there was something touching and fine about it and it was moving to reflect that he was one of a myriad scattered over every part of the globe who by turn were doing as he was doing every hour of the twenty-four those awake doing it while the others slept those impressive bars forever floating up out of the various climes never silent and never lacking reverent listeners all that i remember about madagascar is that thackeray's little billy went up to the top of the mast and there knelt him upon his knee saying i see jerusalem and madagascar and north and south america may third sunday fifteen or twenty africanders who will end their voyage to-day and strike for their several homes from delagoa bay to-morrow sat up singing on the after-deck in the moonlight till three a m good fun and wholesome and the songs were clean songs and some of them were hallowed by their tender associations finally in a pause a man asked if they had heard a certain old and an altogether lowly anecdote it was a discord a wet blanket the men were not in the mood for humorous dirt the songs had carried them to their homes and in spirit they sat by those far hearthstones and saw faces and heard voices other than those that were about them the poor man hadn't wit enough to see that he had blundered but asked his question again again there was no response it was embarrassing for him in his confusion he chose the wrong course did the wrong thing began the anecdote began it in a deep and hostile stillness where had been such life and stir and warm comradeship before the two rows of men sat like statues there was no movement no sound he had to go on there was no other way at least none that an animal of his caliber could think of when at last he finished his tale which is wont to fetch a crash of laughter not a ripple of sound resulted it was as if the tale had been told to dead men after what seemed a long long time somebody sighed somebody else stirred in his seat presently the men dropped into a low murmur of confidential talk each with his neighbor and the incident was closed there were indications that that man was fond of his anecdote that it was his pet his standby his shot that never missed his reputation maker but he will never tell it again no doubt he will think of it sometimes for that cannot well be helped and then he will see a picture and always the same picture the double rank of dead men the vacant deck stretching away in dimming perspective beyond them the wide desert of smooth sea all abroad the rim of the moon spying from behind a rag of black cloud the remote top of the mizzenmast shearing a zigzag path through the field of stars in the deeps of space and this soft picture will remind him of the time that he sat in the midst of it and told his poor little tale and felt so lonesome when he got through fifty indians and chinamen sleep in the big tent in the waist of the ship forward they lie side by side with no space between the former wrapped up head and all as in the indian streets the chinamen uncovered the lamp and things for opium smoking in the centre monday may fourth steaming slowly in the stupendous delagoa bay its dim arms stretching far away and disappearing on both sides it could furnish plenty of room for all the ships in the world but it is shoal the lead has given us three and one-half fathoms several times and we are drawing that lacking six inches 
a bald headland precipitous wall 150 feet high very strong red color stretching a mile or so a man said it was portuguese blood battle fought here with the natives last year i think this doubtful pretty cluster of houses on the tableland above the red and rolling stretches of grass and groups of trees like england the portuguese have the railroad one passenger train a day to the border seventy miles then the netherlands company have it thousands of tons of freight on the shore no cover this is the portuguese all over indolence piousness poverty impotence crews of small boats and tugs all jet black woolly heads and very muscular winter the south african winter is just beginning now but nobody but an expert can tell it from summer however i am tired of summer we have had it unbroken for eleven months we spent this afternoon on shore delagoa bay a small town no sights no carriages three rickshaws but we couldn't get them apparently private these portuguese are a rich brown like some of the indians some of the blacks have the long horse heads and very long chins of the negroes of the picture books but most of them are exactly like the negroes of our southern states round faces flat noses good-natured and easy laughers flocks of black women passed along carrying outrageously heavy bags of freight on their heads the quiver of their leg as the foot was planted and the strain exhibited by their bodies showed what a tax upon their strength the load was they were stevedores and doing full stevedores work they were very erect when unladen from carrying weights on their heads just like the indian women it gives them a proud fine carriage sometimes one saw a woman carrying on her head a laden and top-heavy basket the shape of an inverted pyramid its top the size of a soup plate its base the diameter of a teacup it required nice balancing and got it no bright colors yet there were a good many hindus the second-class passenger came over as usual at lights out eleven and we lounged along the spacious vague solitudes of the deck and smoked the beautiful pipe and talked he told me an incident in mr barnum's life which was evidently characteristic of that great showman in several ways this was barnum's purchase of shakespeare's birthplace a quarter of a century ago the second-class passenger was in jamrack's employ at the time and knew barnum well he said the thing began in this way one morning barnum and jamrack were in jamrack's little private snuggery back of the wilderness of caged monkeys and snakes and other commonplaces of jamrack's stock and trade refreshing themselves after an arduous stroke of business jamrack with something orthodox barnum with something heterodox for barnum was a teetotaler the stroke of business was in the elephant line Jamrack had contracted to deliver to Barnum in New York eighteen elephants for three hundred and sixty thousand dollars in time for the next season's opening. Then it occurred to Mr. Barnum that he needed a card. He suggested Jumbo. Jamrack said he would have to think of something else. Jumbo couldn't be had. The zoo wouldn't part with that elephant. Barnum said he was willing to pay a fortune for Jumbo if he could get him. Jamrack said it was no use to think about it, that Jumbo was as popular as the Prince of Wales, and the zoo wouldn't dare to sell him. All England would be outraged at the idea. Jumbo was an English institution. He was part of the national glory. One might as well think of buying the Nelson Monument. Barnum spoke up with vivacity and said, "'It's a first-rate idea. I'll buy the monument.' jamrack was speechless for a second then he said like one ashamed you caught me i was napping for a moment i thought you were in earnest barnum said pleasantly i was in earnest i know they won't sell it but no matter i will not throw away a good idea for all that all i want is a big advertisement i will keep the thing in mind and if nothing better turns up i will offer to buy it that will answer every purpose it will furnish me a couple of columns of gratis advertising in every English and American paper for a couple of months. 
and give my show the biggest boom a show ever had in this world. Jamrak started to deliver a burst of admiration, but was interrupted by Barnum, who said, Here is a state of things. England ought to blush. His eye had fallen upon something in the newspaper. He read it through to himself, then read it aloud. It said that the house that Shakespeare was born in at Stratford-on-Avon was falling gradually to ruin through neglect, that the room where the poet first saw the light was now serving as a butcher's shop, that all appeals to England to contribute money, the requisite sum stated, to buy and repair the house and place it in the care of salaried and trustworthy keepers, had fallen resultless. Then Barnum said, "'There's my chance. Let Jumbo and the Monument alone for the present. They'll keep. I'll buy Shakespeare's house. I'll set it up in my museum in New York, and put a glass case around it, and make a sacred thing of it. And you'll see all America flock there to worship, yes, and pilgrims from the whole world, and I'll make them take their hats off, too.' In America we know how to value anything that Shakespeare's touch has made holy. You'll see. In conclusion, the S.C.P. said, That is the way the thing came about. Barnum did buy Shakespeare's house. He paid the price asked, and received the properly attested documents of sale. Then there was an explosion, I can tell you. England rose. What? the birthplace of the master genius of all the ages and all the climes, that priceless possession of Britain, to be carried out of the country like so much old lumber and set up for six-penny desecration in a Yankee show-shop. The idea was not to be tolerated for a moment. England rose in her indignation, and Barnum was glad to relinquish his prize and offer apologies. However, he stood out for a compromise. He claimed a concession— England must let him have Jumbo, and England consented, but not cheerfully. It shows how, by help of time, a story can grow, even after Barnum has had the first innings in the telling of it. Mr. Barnum told me the story himself years ago. He said that the permission to buy Jumbo was not a concession. The permission was made and the animal delivered before the public knew anything about it also that the securing of Jumbo was all the advertisement he needed. It produced many columns of newspaper talk free of cost, and he was satisfied. He said that if he had failed to get Jumbo he would have caused his notion of buying the Nelson Monument to be treacherously smuggled into print by some trusty friend, and after he had gotten a few hundred pages of gratuitous advertising out of it, he would have come out with a blundering obtuse but warm-hearted letter of apology, and in a postscript to it would have naively proposed to let the monument go and take Stonehenge in place of it at the same price. It was his opinion that such a letter, written with well-simulated asinine innocence and gush, would have gotten his ignorance and stupidity an amount of newspaper abuse worth six fortunes to him, and not purchasable for twice the money. I knew Mr. Barnum well, and I placed every confidence in the account which he gave me of the Shakespeare birthplace episode. He said he found the house neglected and going to decay, and he inquired into the matter and was told that many times earnest efforts had been made to raise money for its proper repair and preservation, but without success. He then proposed to buy it. The proposition was entertained and a price named, fifty thousand dollars, I think. But whatever it was, Barnum paid the money down without remark, and the papers were drawn up and executed. He said that it had been his purpose to set up the house in his museum, keep it in repair, protect it from name-scribblers and other decorators, and leave it by bequest to the safe and perpetual guardianship of the Smithsonian Institution at Washington. But as soon as it was found that Shakespeare's house had passed into foreign hands, and was going to be carried across the ocean, England was stirred as no appeal from the custodians of the relic had ever stirred her before, and protests came flowing in, and money too, to stop the outrage. Offers of repurchase were made, offers of double the money that Mr. Barnum had paid for the house. He handed the house back, and took only the sum which it had cost him, 
but on the condition that an endowment sufficient for the future safeguarding and maintenance of the sacred relic should be raised this condition was fulfilled that was barnum's account of the episode and to the end of his days he claimed with pride and satisfaction that not england but america represented by him saved the birthplace of shakespeare from destruction at three p m may sixth the ship slowed down off the land and thoughtfully and cautiously picked her way into the snug harbor of durban south africa editor's note these chapters copyright eighteen ninety seven by olivia l clemens are from a forthcoming book by mark twain entitled following the equator and are published here by special arrangement with the american publishing company of hartford connecticut they constitute the only account of any part of mark twain's recent journey around the world that will appear in periodical form and all rights are expressly reserved the book will be sold only by subscription and its sale in new york and the vicinity is under the exclusive control of the doubleday and mcclure company end of editor's note an end of from india to south africa by mark twain read by john greenman the eskimo maiden's romance by mark twain yes i will tell you anything about my life that you would like to know mr twain she said in her soft voice and letting her honest eyes rest placidly upon my face for it is kind and good of you to like me and care to know about me she had been absently scraping blubber grease from her cheeks with a small bone knife and transferring it to her fur sleeve while she watched the aurora borealis swing its flaming streamers out of the sky and wash the lonely snow plain and the templed icebergs with the rich hues of the prism a spectacle of almost intolerable splendor and beauty but now she shook off her reverie and prepared to give me the humble little history i had asked for she settled herself comfortably on the block of ice which we were using as a sofa and i made ready to listen she was a beautiful creature I speak from the Eskimo point of view. Others would have thought her a trifle over plump. She was just twenty years old, and was held to be by far the most bewitching girl in her tribe. Even now, in the open air, with her cumbersome and shapeless fur coat, and trousers and boots and vast hood, the beauty of her face was at least apparent. But her figure had to be taken on trust. Among all the guests who came and went, I had seen no girl at her father's hospitable trough who could be called her equal. Yet she was not spoiled. She was sweet and natural and sincere. And if she was aware that she was a belle, there was nothing about her ways to show that she possessed that knowledge. She had been my daily comrade for a week now, and the better I knew her, the better I liked her. She had been tenderly and carefully brought up in an atmosphere of singularly rare refinement for the polar regions, for her father was the most important man of his tribe, and ranked at the top of Eskimo civilization. I made long dog-sledge trips across the mighty ice floes with Laska, that was her name, and found her company always pleasant and her conversation agreeable. I went fishing with her, but not in her perilous boat. I merely followed along on the ice and watched her strike her game with her fatally accurate spear. We went sealing together. Several times I stood by while she and the family dug blubber from the stranded whale, and once I went part of the way when she was hunting a bear, but turned back before the finish, because at bottom I am afraid of bears. However, she was ready to begin her story now, and this is what she said. Our tribe had always been used to wander about from place to place over the frozen seas, like the other tribes, but my father got tired of that two years ago, and built this great mansion of frozen snow-blocks. Look at it. It is seven feet high, and three or four times as long as any of the others, and here we have stayed ever since. He was very proud of his house, and that was reasonable, for if you have examined it with care, you must have noticed how much finer and completer it is than houses usually are. 
but if you have not, you must, for you will find it has luxurious appointments that are quite beyond the common. For instance, in that end of it, which you have called the parlor, the raised platform for the accommodation of guests and the family at meals is the largest you have ever seen in any house, is it not so? Yes, you are quite right, Laska. It is the largest. We have nothing resembling it in even the finest houses in the United States. This admission made her eyes sparkle with pride and pleasure. I noted that, and took my cue. I thought it must have surprised you, she said. And another thing, it is bedded far deeper in furs than is usual, all kinds of furs, seal, sea otter, silver-gray fox, bear, marten, sable, every kind of fur in profusion, and the same with the ice-block sleeping benches along the walls which you call beds. Are your platforms and sleeping benches better provided at home? Indeed they are not, Laska. They do not begin to be. That pleased her again. All she was thinking of was the number of furs her aesthetic father took the trouble to keep on hand, not their value. I could have told her that those masses of rich furs constituted wealth, or would in my country, but she would not have understood that. Those were not the kind of things that ranked as riches with her people. I could have told her that the clothes she had on, or the everyday clothes of the commonest person about her, were worth twelve or fifteen hundred dollars, and that I was not acquainted with anybody at home who wore twelve hundred dollar toilets to go fishing in. But she would not have understood it. So I said nothing, and she resumed. And then the slop-tubs. We have two in the parlor and two in the rest of the house. It is very seldom that one has two in the parlor. Have you two in the parlor at home? The memory of those tubs made me gasp. But I recovered myself before she noticed, and said with effusion, "'Why, Alaska, it is a shame of me to expose my country, and you must not let it go further, for I am speaking to you in confidence. But I give you my word of honor that not even the richest man in the city of New York has two slop-tubs in his drawing-room.' She clapped her fur-clad hands in innocent delight, and exclaimed, "'Oh, but you cannot mean it, you cannot mean it!' "'Indeed, I am in earnest, dear. There is Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt is almost the richest man in the whole world. Now, if I were on my dying bed, I could say to you that not even he has two in his drawing-room. Why, he hasn't even one. I wish I may die in my tracks if it isn't true." Her lovely eyes stood wide with amazement, and she said slowly, and with a sort of awe in her voice, "'How strange! How incredible! One is not able to realize it. Is he penurious?' No, it isn't that. It isn't the expense he minds. But, uh, well, you know, it would look like showing off. Yes, that is it. That is the idea. He is a plain man in his way, and shrinks from display. Why, that humility is right enough, said Laska, if one does not carry it too far. But what does the place look like? Well, necessarily it looks pretty barren and unfinished, but— I should think so. I never heard anything like it. Is it a fine house, that is, otherwise? Pretty fine, yes. It is very well thought of." The girl was silent a while, and sat dreamily gnawing a candle-end, apparently trying to think the thing out. At last she gave her head a little toss, and spoke out her opinion with decision. Well, to my mind, there's a breed of humility which is itself a species of showing off when you get down to the marrow of it. And when a man is able to afford two slop-tubs in his parlor and doesn't do it, it may be that he is truly humble-minded, but it's a hundred times more likely that he is just trying to strike the public eye. In my judgment, your Mr. Vanderbilt knows what he is about." I tried to modify this verdict, feeling that a double slop-tub standard was not a fair one to try everybody by, although a sound enough one in its own habitat. But the girl's head was set, and she was not to be persuaded. Presently she said, "'Do the rich people, with you, have as good sleeping benches as ours, and made out as nice broad ice-blocks?' "'Well, they are pretty good, good enough, but they are not made of ice-blocks. I want to know, why aren't they made of ice-blocks?' I explained the difficulties in the way, 
and the expensiveness of ice in a country where you have to keep a sharp eye on your ice man or your ice bill will weigh more than your ice then she cried out dear me do you buy your ice we most certainly do dear she burst into a gale of guileless laughter and said oh i never heard of anything so silly why there's plenty of it it isn't worth anything why there's a hundred miles of it in sight right now i wouldn't give a fish bladder for the whole of it well it's because you don't know how to value it you little provincial muggings if you had it in new york in midsummer you could buy all the whales in the market with it she looked at me doubtfully and said are you speaking true absolutely i take my oath to it this made her thoughtful presently she said with a little sigh i wish i could live there i had merely meant to furnish her a standard of values which she could understand but my purpose had miscarried i had only given her the impression that whales were cheap and plenty in new york and set her mouth to watering for them it seemed best to try to mitigate the evil which i had done so i said but you wouldn't care for whale meat if you lived there nobody does what indeed they don't why don't they well i hardly know it's prejudice i think yes that is it just prejudice i reckon somebody that hadn't anything better to do started a prejudice against it some time or other and once you get a caprice like that fairly going you know it will last no end of time that is true perfectly true said the girl reflectively like our prejudice against soap here our tribes had a prejudice against soap at first you know i glanced at her to see if she was in earnest evidently she was i hesitated then said cautiously but pardon me they had a prejudice against soap had with falling inflection yes but that was only at first nobody would eat it oh i understand i didn't get your idea before she resumed it was just a prejudice the first time soap came here from the foreigners nobody liked it but as soon as it got to be fashionable everybody liked it and now everybody has it that can afford it are you fond of it yes indeed i should die if i couldn't have it especially here do you like it i just adore it do you like candles i regard them as an absolute necessity are you fond of them her eyes fairly danced and she exclaimed oh don't mention it candles and soap and fish interiors and train oil and slush and whale blubber and carrion and sauerkraut and beeswax and tar and turpentine and molasses and don't oh don't i shall expire with ecstasy and then serve it all up in a slush bucket and invite the neighbors and sail in but this vision of an ideal feast was too much for her and she swooned away poor thing i rubbed snow in her face and brought her to and after a while got her excitement cooled down by and by she drifted into her story again so we began to live here in the fine house but i was not happy the reason was this i was born for love for me there could be no true happiness without it i wanted to be loved for myself alone i wanted an idol and i wanted to be my idol's idol nothing less than mutual idolatry would satisfy my fervent nature i had suitors in plenty in overplenty indeed but in each and every case they had a fatal defect sooner or later i discovered that defect not one of them failed to betray it it was not me they wanted but my wealth your wealth yes for my father is much the richest man in this tribe or in any tribe in these regions i wondered what her father's wealth consisted of it couldn't be the house anybody could build its mate it couldn't be the furs they were not valued it couldn't be the sledge the dogs the harpoons the boat the bone fish-hooks and needles and such things no these were not wealth then what could it be that made this man so rich and brought this swarm of sordid suitors to his house it seemed to me finally that the best way to find out would be to ask so i did it the girl was so manifestly gratified by the question that i saw she had been aching to have me ask it 
she was suffering fully as much to tell as I was to know. She snuggled confidently up to me and said, "'Guess how much he is worth. You never can.' I pretended to consider the matter deeply, she watching my anxious and laboring countenance with a devouring and delighted interest. And when, at last, I gave it up and begged her to appease my longing by telling me herself how much this polar Vanderbilt was worth, she put her mouth close to my ear and whispered impressively, Twenty-two fish-hooks, not bone, but foreign, made out of real iron. Then she sprang back dramatically to observe the effect. I did my level best not to disappoint her. I turned pale and murmured, Great Scott! It's as true as you live, Mr. Twain. Laska, you are deceiving me. You cannot mean it. She was frightened and troubled. She exclaimed, Mr. Twain, every word of it is true, every word. You believe me. You do believe me now, don't you? Oh, say you believe me. Do say you believe me. I, uh, well, yes, I do. I am trying to, but it is all so sudden, so sudden and prostrating. You shouldn't do such a thing in that sudden way. It, oh, I'm so sorry. If I had only thought, well, it's all right. And I don't blame you any more, for you are young and thoughtless, and, of course, you couldn't foresee what an effect. But, oh, dear, I, I ought certainly to have known better. Why, you see, Laska, if you had said five or six hooks to start with, and then gradually, oh, I see, I see, then gradually added one, and then two, and then, ah, oh, why couldn't I have thought of that? Never mind, child, it's all right. I am better now. I shall be over it in a little while. But to spring the whole twenty-two on a person unprepared and not very strong anyway, oh, it was a crime. But you forgive me. Say you forgive me. Do. After harvesting a good deal of very pleasant coaxing and petting and persuading, I forgave her and she was happy again. And by and by she got under way with her narrative once more. I presently discovered that the family treasury contained still another feature a jewel of some sort, apparently, and that she was trying to get around speaking squarely about it, lest I get paralyzed again. But I wanted to know about that thing, too, and urged her to tell me what it was. She was afraid. But I insisted, and said I would brace myself this time and be prepared. Then the shock would not hurt me. She was full of misgivings. But the temptation to reveal that marvel to me, and enjoy my astonishment and admiration, was too strong for her, and she confessed that she had it on her person, and said that if I was sure I was prepared, and so on and so on, and with that she reached into her bosom and brought out a battered square of brass, watching my eye anxiously the while. I fell over against her in a quite well-acted faint, which delighted her heart and nearly frightened it out of her, too, at the same time. When I came to and got calm, she was eager to know what I thought of her jewel. What do I think of it? I think it is the most exquisite thing I ever saw. Do you really? How nice of you to say that. But it is a love now, isn't it? Well, I should say so. I'd rather own it than the equator. I thought you would admire it, she said. I think it is so lovely. And there isn't another one in all these latitudes. People have come all the way from the open polar sea to look at it. Did you ever see one before? I said no, this was the first one I had ever seen. It cost me a pang to tell that generous lie, for I had seen a million of them in my time, this humble jewel of hers being nothing but a battered old New York Central baggage check. Land, said I, you don't go about with it on your person this way, and alone, and with no protection, n not even a dog? Shh, not so loud, she said. Nobody knows I carry it with me. They think it is in Papa's treasury. That is where it generally is. Where is the treasury? It was a blunt question, and for a moment she looked startled and a little suspicious. But I said, Oh, come, don't you be afraid about me. At home we have seventy millions of people, and although I say it myself that shouldn't, there is not one person among them all but would trust me with untold fish-hooks. This reassured her, and she told me where the hooks were hidden in the house. Then she wandered from her course to brag a little about the size of the sheets of transparent ice that formed the windows of the mansion, and asked me if I had ever seen their like at home. 
and I came right out frankly and confessed that I hadn't, which pleased her more than she could find words to dress her gratification in. It was so easy to please her, and such a pleasure to do it, that I went on and said, Ah, Alaska, you are a fortunate girl. This beautiful house, this dainty jewel, that rich treasure, all this elegant snow and sumptuous icebergs and limitless sterility, and public bears and walruses and noble freedom and largeness and everybody's admiring eyes upon you and everybody's homage and respect at your command without the asking young rich beautiful sought courted envied not a requirement unsatisfied not a desire ungratified nothing to wish for that you cannot have it is immeasurable good fortune i have seen myriads of girls but none of whom these extraordinary things could be truthfully said but you alone and you are worthy worthy of it all laska i believe it in my heart it made her infinitely proud and happy to hear me say this and she thanked me over and over again for that closing remark and her voice and eyes showed that she was touched presently she said still it is not all sunshine there is a cloudy side. The burden of wealth is a heavy one to bear. Sometimes I have doubted if it were not better to be poor, at least not inordinately rich. It pains me to see neighboring tribesmen stare as they pass by, and overhear them say, reverently, one to another, There, that is she, the millionaire's daughter. And sometimes they say sorrowfully, She is rolling in fish-hooks, and I, I have nothing. It breaks my heart. When I was a child and we were poor, we slept with the door open if we chose. But now, now we have to have a night watchman. In those days my father was gentle and courteous to all. But now he is austere and haughty, and cannot abide familiarity. Once his family were his sole thought, but now he goes about thinking of his fish-hooks all the time, and his wealth makes everybody cringing and obsequious to him formerly nobody laughed at his jokes they being always stale and far-fetched and poor and destitute of the one element that can really justify a joke the element of humor but now everybody laughs and cackles at these dismal things and if any fails to do it my father is deeply displeased and shows it formerly his opinion was not sought upon any matter and was not valuable when he volunteered it it has that infirmity yet but nevertheless it is sought by all and applauded by all and he helps to do the applauding himself having no true delicacy and a plentiful want of tact he has lowered the tone of all our tribe once they were a frank and manly race now they are measly hypocrites and sodden with servility in my heart of hearts i hate all the ways of millionaires our tribe was once plain simple folk and content with the bone fish-hooks of their fathers. Now they are eaten up with the avarice, and would sacrifice every sentiment of honor and honesty to possess themselves of the debasing iron fish-hooks of the foreigner. However, I must not dwell on these sad things. As I have said, it was my dream to be loved for myself alone. At last this dream seemed about to be fulfilled. A stranger came by one day who said his name was Kalula. I told him my name, and he said he loved me. My heart gave a great bound of gratitude and pleasure, for I had loved him at sight, and now I said so. He took me to his breast and said he would not wish to be happier than he was now. We went strolling together far over the ice-flows, telling all about each other, and planning, oh, the loveliest future. When we were tired at last we sat down and ate, for he had soap and candles, and I had brought along some blubber. We were hungry, and nothing was ever so good. He belonged to a tribe whose haunts were far to the north, and I found that he had never heard of my father, which rejoiced me exceedingly. I mean, he had heard of the millionaire, but had never heard his name. So, you see, he could not know that I was the heiress. You may be sure that I did not tell him. I was loved for myself at last, and was satisfied. I was so happy, oh, happier than you can think. 
by and by it was toward supper time and i led him home as we approached our house he was amazed and cried out how splendid is that your father's it gave me a pang to hear that tone and see that admiring light in his eye but the feeling quickly passed away for i loved him so and he looked so handsome and noble all my family of aunts and uncles and cousins were pleased with him and many guests were called in and the house was shut up tight and the rag lamps lighted and when everything was hot and comfortable and suffocating we began a joyous feast in celebration of my betrothal when the feast was over my father's vanity overcame him and he could not resist the temptation to show off his riches and let Kalula see what grand good fortune he had stumbled into and mainly of course he wanted to enjoy the poor man's amazement i could have cried but it would have done no good to try to dissuade my father so i said nothing but merely sat there and suffered my father went straight to the hiding-place in full sight of everybody and got out the fish-hooks and brought them and flung them scatteringly over my head so that they fell in glittering confusion on the platform at my lover's knee of course the astounding spectacle took the poor lad's breath away he could only stare in stupid astonishment and wonder how a single individual could possess such incredible riches then presently he glanced brilliantly up and exclaimed ah oh, it is you who are the renowned millionaire my father and all the rest burst into shouts of happy laughter and when my father gathered the treasure carelessly up as if it might be mere rubbish and of no consequence and carried it back to its place poor kalula's surprise was a study he said is it possible that you put such things away without counting them my father delivered a vainglorious horse laugh and said well truly a body may know you have never been rich since a mere matter of a fish-hook or two is such a mighty matter in your eyes kalula was confused and hung his head but said ah indeed sir i was never worth the value of the barb of one of those precious things and i have never seen any man before who was so rich in them as to render the counting of his hoard worth while since the wealthiest man i have ever known till now was possessed of but three my foolish father roared again with jejune delight and allowed the impression to remain that he was not accustomed to count his hooks and keep a sharp watch over them he was showing off you see count them why he counted them every day i had met and got acquainted with my darling just at dawn i had brought him home just at dark three hours afterwards for the days were shortening toward the six months night at that time we kept up the festivities many hours then at last the guests departed and the rest of us distributed ourselves along the walls on sleeping benches and soon all were steeped in dreams but me i was too happy too excited to sleep after i had lain quiet a long long time a dim form passed by me and was swallowed up in the gloom that pervaded the farther end of the house i could not make out who it was or whether it was man or woman presently that figure or another one passed me going the other way i wondered what it all meant but wondering did no good and while i was still wondering i fell asleep i did not know how long i slept but at last i came suddenly broad awake and heard my father say in a terrible voice by the great snow god there's a fish hook gone something told me that that meant sorrow for me and the blood in my veins turned cold the presentiment was confirmed in the same instant my father shouted up everybody and seize the stranger then there was an outburst of cries and curses from all sides and a wild rush of dim forms through the obscurity i flew to my beloved's help but what could i do but wait and wring my hands he was already fenced away from me by a living wall he was being bound hand and foot not until he was secured would they let me get to him i flung myself upon his poor insulted form and cried my grief out upon his breast while my father and all my family scoffed at me and heaped threats and shameful epithets upon him he bore his ill usage with a tranquil dignity which endeared him to me more than ever and made me proud and happy to suffer with him and for him i heard my father order that the elders of the tribe be called together to try kalula for his life 
What? I said. Before any search has been made for the lost hook? Lost hook? They all shouted in derision. And my father added mockingly, Stand back, everybody, and be properly serious. She is going to hunt up that lost hook. Oh, without doubt she will find it. Whereat they all laughed again. I was not disturbed. I had no fears, no doubts. I said, It is for you to laugh now. It is your turn. But ours is coming. Wait and see. I got a rag lamp. I thought I should find that miserable thing in one little moment, and I set about that matter with such confidence that those people grew grace, beginning to suspect that perhaps they had been too hasty. But, alas and alas, oh, the bitterness of that search! There was a deep silence while one might count his fingers ten or twelve times. Then my heart began to sink, and around me the mockings began again and grew steadily louder and more assured, until at last, when I gave up, they burst into volley after volley of cruel laughter. None will ever know what I suffered then, but my love was my support and my strength, and I took my rightful place at my Kalula's side, and put my arm about his neck, and whispered in his ear, saying, You are innocent, my own, that I know, but say it to me yourself, for my comfort then I can bear whatever is in store for us. He answered, As surely as I stand upon the brink of death at this moment I am innocent. Be comforted then, O bruised heart, be at peace, O thou breath of my nostrils, life of my life. Now then, let the elders come. And as I said the words there was a gathering sound of crunching snow outside, and then a vision of stooping forms filling in at the door. The elders. My father formally accused the prisoner, and detailed the happenings of the night. He said that the watchman was outside the door, and that in the house were none but the family and the stranger. Would the family steal their own property? He paused. The elders sat silent many minutes. At last, one after another said to his neighbor, This looks bad for the stranger. Sorrowful words for me to hear. Then my father sat down. Oh, miserable, miserable me! At that very moment I could have proved my darling innocent, but I did not know it. The chief of the court asked, Is there any here to defend the prisoner? I rose and said, Why should he steal that hook, or any, or all of them? In another day he would have been heir to the whole. I stood waiting. There was a long silence, the steam from the many breaths rising about me like a fog. At last one elder after another nodded his head slowly several times and muttered, There is force in what the child has said. Oh, the heart lift that was in those words, so transient, but oh, so precious. I sat down. If any would say further, let him speak now, or after, hold his peace, said the chief of the court. My father rose and said, In the night, a form passed by me in the gloom going toward the treasury and presently returned. I think now it was the stranger. Oh, I was like to swoon. I had supposed that that was my secret, not the grip of the great ice-god himself could have dragged it out of my heart. The chief of the court said sternly to my poor Kalula, Speak. Kalula hesitated, then answered, It was I. I could not sleep for thinking of the beautiful hooks. I went there and kissed them and fondled them, to appease my spirit, and drown it in a harmless joy. Then I put them back. I may have dropped one, but I stole none. Oh, a fatal admission to make in such a place! There was an awful hush. I knew he had pronounced his own doom and that all was over. On every face you could see the words hieroglyphed, It is a confession and paltry, lame, and thin. I sat drawing in my breath in faint gasps and waiting. Presently I heard the solemn words I knew were coming, and each word as it came was a knife in my heart. It is the command of the court that the accused be subjected to the trial by water. Oh, 
curses be upon the head of him who brought trial by water to our land it came generations ago from some far country that lies none knows where before that our fathers used augury and other unsure methods of trial and doubtless some poor guilty creatures escaped with their lives sometimes but it is not so with trial by water which is an invention by wiser men than we poor ignorant savages are by it the innocent are proved innocent without doubt or question for they drown and the guilty are proven guilty with the same certainty for they do not drown my heart was breaking in my bosom for i said he is innocent and he will go down under the waves and i shall never see him more i never left his side after that i mourned in his arms all the precious hours and he poured out the deep stream of his love upon me and oh i was so miserable and so happy at last they tore him from me and i followed sobbing after them and saw them fling him into the sea then i covered my face with my hands agony oh i know the deepest deeps of that word the next moment the people burst into a shout of malicious joy and i took away my hands startled oh bitter sight he was swimming my heart turned instantly to stone to ice i said he was guilty and he lied to me i turned my back in scorn and went my way homeward they took him far out to sea and set him on an iceberg that was drifting southward in the great waters then my family came home and my father said to me your thief sent his dying message to you saying tell her i am innocent and that all the days and all the hours and all the minutes while i starve and perish i shall love her and think of her and bless the day that gave me sight of her sweet face quite pretty even poetical i said he is dirt let me never hear mention of him again and oh to think he was innocent all the time nine months nine dull sad months went by and at last came the day of the great annual sacrifice when all the maidens of the tribe wash their faces and comb their hair with the first sweep of my comb out came the fatal fish-hook from where it had been all those months nestling and i fell fainting into the arms of my remorseful father groaning he said we murdered him and i shall never smile again he has kept his word listen from that day to this not a month goes by that i do not comb my hair but oh where is the good of it all now so ended the poor maid's humble little tale whereby we learn that since a hundred million dollars in new york and twenty-two fish-hooks on the border of the arctic circle represent the same financial supremacy a man in straitened circumstances is a fool to stay in new york when he can buy ten cents worth of fish-hooks and emigrate end of the eskimo maiden's romance by mark twain read by john greenman at the appetite cure by mark twain this establishment's name is hochberhaus it is in bohemia a short day's journey from vienna and being in the austrian empire is of course a health resort the empire is made up of health resorts it distributes health to the whole world its waters are all medicinal they are bottled and sent throughout the earth the natives themselves drink beer this is self-sacrifice apparently but outlanders who have drunk vienna beer have another idea about it particularly the pilsner which one gets in a small cellar up an obscure back lane in the first bezirk the name has escaped me but the place is easily found you inquire for the greek church and when you get to it go right along by the next house is that little beer mill it is remote from all traffic and all noise it is always sunday there there are two small rooms with low ceilings supported by massive arches the arches and ceilings are whitewashed otherwise the rooms would pass for cells in the dungeons of a bastille 
the furniture is plain and cheap there is no ornamentation anywhere yet it is a heaven for the self-sacrificers for the beer there is incomparable there is nothing like it elsewhere in the world in the first room you will find twelve or fifteen ladies and gentlemen of civilian quality in the other one a dozen generals and ambassadors one may live in vienna many months and not hear of this place but having once heard of it and sampled it the sampler will afterward infest it however this is all incidental a mere passing note of gratitude for blessings received it has nothing to do with my subject my subject is health resorts all unhealthy people ought to domicile themselves in vienna and use that as a base making flights from time to time to the outlying resorts according to need a flight to marienbad to get rid of fat a flight to carlsbad to get rid of rheumatism a flight to kaltenneutgeben to take the water cure and get rid of the rest of the diseases it is all so handy you can stand in vienna and toss a biscuit into kaltenleutgeben with a twelve-inch gun you can run out thither at any time of the day you go by phenomenally slow trains and yet inside of an hour you have exchanged the glare and swelter of the city for wooded hills and shady forest paths and soft cool airs and the music of birds and the repose and the peace of paradise and there are plenty of other health resorts at your service and convenient to get at from vienna charming places all of them vienna sits in the center of a beautiful world of mountains with now and then a lake and forests in fact no other city is so fortunately situated there is an abundance of health resorts as i have said among them this place Hockerhaus. it stands solitary on the top of a densely wooded mountain and is a building of great size. It is called the Appetite Anstalt, and people who have lost their appetites come here to get them restored. When I arrived I was taken by Professor Heimberger to his consulting-room, and questioned. It is six o'clock. When did you eat last? At noon. What did you eat? Next to nothing. What was on the table? The usual things chops chickens vegetables and so on yes uh, but don't mention them i can't bear it are you tired of them oh utterly i wish i might never hear of them again the mere sight of food offends you does it more it revolts me the doctor considered a while then got out a long menu and ran his eye slowly down it i think said he that what you need to eat is uh, but here uh, choose for yourself i glanced at the list and my stomach threw a handspring of all the barbarous layouts that were ever contrived this was the most atrocious at the top stood tough underdone overdue tripe garnished with garlic halfway down the bill stood young cat old cat scrambled cat at the bottom stood sailor boots softened with tallow served raw the wide intervals of the bill were packed with dishes calculated to gag a cannibal i said doctor it is not fair to joke over so serious a case as mine i came here to get an appetite not to throw away the remnant that's left he said gravely i am not joking why should i joke but i can't eat these horrors why not he said it with a naivete that was admirable whether it was real or assumed why not because why doctor for months i have seldom been able to endure anything more substantial than omelettes and custards these unspeakable dishes of yours oh you will come to like them they are very good and you must eat them it is a rule of the place and is strict i cannot permit any departure from it i said smiling well then doctor you will have to permit the departure of the patient i am going he looked hurt and said in a way which changed the aspect of things i am sure you would not do me that injustice i accepted you in good faith you will not shame that confidence uh, this appetite cure is my whole living 
if you should go forth from it with the sort of appetite which you now have it could become known and you can see yourself that people would say my cure failed in your case and hence my can fail in other cases you will not go you will not do me this hurt i apologized and said i would stay that is right i was sure you would not go it would take the food from my family's mouths would they mind that do they eat these fiendish things they my family his eyes were full of gentle wonder of course not oh they don't do you certainly not i see it's another case of a physician who doesn't take his own medicine i don't need it it is uh, six hours since you lunched will you have supper now or later i am not hungry but now is as good a time as any and i would like to be done with it and have it off my mind it is about my usual time and regularity is commanded by all the authorities yes i will try to nibble a little now i wish a light horsewhipping would answer instead the professor handed me that odious menu choose or will you have it later oh dear me show me to my room i forgot your hard rule wait uh, just a moment before you finally decide there is another rule if you choose now the order will be filled at once but if you wait you will have to await my pleasure you cannot get a dish from that entire bill until i consent all right show me to my room and send the cook to bed there is not going to be any hurry the professor took me up one flight of stairs and showed me into a most inviting and comfortable apartment consisting of parlor bedchamber and bathroom the front windows looked out over a far-reaching spread of green glades and valleys and tumbled hills clothed with forests a noble solitude unvexed by the fussy world in the parlor were many shelves filled with books the professor said he would now leave me to myself and added smoke and read as much as you please drink all the water you like when you get hungry ring and give your order and i will decide whether it shall be filled or not yours is a stubborn bad case and i think the first fourteen dishes in the bill are each and all too delicate for its needs i ask you as a favor to restrain yourself and not call for them restrain myself is it give yourself no uneasiness you are going to save money by me the idea of coaxing a sick man's appetite back with this buzzard fare is clear insanity i said it with bitterness for i felt outraged by this calm cold talk over these heartless new engines of assassination the doctor looked grieved but not offended he laid the bill of fare of the commode at my bed's head so that it would be handy and said yours is not the worst case i have encountered by any means still it is a bad one and requires robust treatment therefore i shall be gratified if you will restrain yourself and skip down to number fifteen and begin with that then he left me and i began to undress for i was dog-tired and very sleepy i slept fifteen hours and woke up finally refreshed at ten the next morning vienna coffee it was the first thing i thought of that unapproachable luxury that sumptuous coffee-house coffee compared with which all other european coffee and all american hotel coffee is mere fluid poverty i rang and ordered it also vienna bread that delicious invention the servant spoke through the wicket in the door and said but you know what he said he referred me to the bill of fare i allowed him to go i had no further use for him after the bath i dressed and started for a walk and got as far as the door it was locked on the outside i rang and the servant came and explained that it was another rule the seclusion of the patient was required until after the first meal i had not been particularly anxious to get out before but it was different now being locked in makes a person wishful to get out i soon began to find it difficult to put in the time at two o'clock i had been twenty-six hours without food i had been growing hungry for some time i recognized that i was not only hungry now 
but hungry with a strong adjective in front of it. Yet I was not hungry enough to face the bill of fare. I must put in the time somehow. I would read and smoke. I did it, hour by hour. The books were all of one breed, shipwrecks, people lost in deserts, people shut up in caved mines, people starving in besieged cities. I read about all the revolting dishes that ever famishing men had stayed their hunger with. During the first hours these things nauseated me. Hours followed in which they did not so affect me. Still other hours followed in which I found myself smacking my lips over some tolerably infernal messes. When I had been without food forty-five hours, I ran eagerly to the bell and ordered the second dish in the bill, which was a sort of dumplings containing a compost made of caviar and tar. It was refused me. During the next fifteen hours I visited the bell every now and then and ordered a dish that was further down the list. Always a refusal. But I was conquering prejudice after prejudice right along. I was making sure progress. I was creeping up on number fifteen with deadly certainty, and my heart beat faster and faster, my hopes rose higher and higher. At last, when food had not passed my lips for sixty hours, victory was mine, and I ordered number fifteen. Soft-boiled spring chicken, in the egg, six dozen, hot and fragrant. In fifteen minutes it was there, and the doctor along with it, rubbing his hands with joy. He said, with great excitement, "'It's a cure! It's a cure! I knew I could do it! Dear sir, my grand system never failed! Never! You've got your appetite back! You know you have! Say it, and make me happy! Bring on your carrion! I can eat anything in the bill!' "'Oh, this is noble! This is splendid! But I knew I could do it! The system never fails! How are the birds?' Never was anything so delicious in the world, and yet as a rule I don't care for game. But don't interrupt me, don't. I can't spare my mouth, I really can't. Then the doctor said, The cure is perfect. There is no more doubt, nor danger. Let the poultry alone. I can trust you with a beefsteak now. The beefsteak came, as much as a basket full of it, with potatoes, and Vienna bread and coffee and I ate a meal then that was worth all the costly preparation I had made for it, and dripped tears of gratitude into the gravy all the time. Gratitude to the doctor for putting a little plain common sense into me when I had been empty of it so many, many years. 2. Thirty years ago Heimberger went off on a long voyage in a sailing ship. There were fifteen passengers on board. The table fare was of the regulation pattern of the day. At seven in the morning a cup of bad coffee in bed. At nine breakfast. Bad coffee with condensed milk, soggy rolls, crackers, salt fish. At one p.m. luncheon. Cold tongue, cold ham, cold corned beef, soggy cold rolls, crackers. Five p.m. dinner. Thick pea soup, salt fish, hot corned beef, and sauerkraut boiled pork and beans, pudding. Nine till eleven p.m., supper. Tea with condensed milk, cold tongue, cold ham, pickles, sea biscuit, pickled oysters, pickled pig's feet, grilled bones, golden buck. At the end of the first week eating had ceased. Nibbling had taken its place. The passengers came to the table, but it was partly to put in the time and partly because the wisdom of the ages commanded them to be regular in their meals. They were tired of the coarse and monotonous fare, and took no interest in it, had no appetite for it. All day and every day they roamed the ship half-hungry, plagued by their gnawing stomachs, moody, untalkative, miserable. Among them were three confirmed dyspeptics. These became shadows in the course of three weeks, there was also a bedridden invalid. He lived on boiled rice. He could not look at the regular dishes. Now came shipwrecks and life in open boats, with the usual paucity of food. Provisions ran lower and lower. The appetites improved then. When nothing was left but raw ham and the ration of that was down to two ounces a day per person, the appetites were perfect. 
at the end of fifteen days the dyspeptics the invalid and the most delicate ladies in the party were chewing sailor boots in ecstasy and only complaining because the supply of them was limited yet these were the same people who couldn't endure the ship's tedious corned beef and sauerkraut and other crudities they were rescued by an english vessel within ten days the whole fifteen were in as good condition as they had been when the shipwreck occurred they had suffered no damage by their adventure said the professor do you note that yes do you note it well yes i think i do but you don't you hesitate you don't rise to the importance of it i will say it again with emphasis not one of them suffered any damage now i begin to see yes it was indeed remarkable nothing of the kind it was perfectly natural there was no reason why they should suffer damage they were undergoing nature's appetite cure the best and wisest in the world is that where you got your idea that is where i got it it taught those people a valuable lesson what makes you think that why shouldn't i you seem to think it taught you one that is nothing to the point i am not a fool i see were they fools they were human beings is it the same thing why do you ask you know it yourself as regards his health and the rest of the things the average man is what his environment and his superstitions have made him and their function is to make him an ass he can't add up three or four new circumstances together and perceive what they mean it is beyond him he is not capable of observing for himself he has to get everything at second hand if what are miscalled the lower animals were as silly as man is they would all perish from the earth in a year those passengers learned no lesson then not a sign of it they went to their regular meals in the english ship and pretty soon they were nibbling again nibbling appetiteless disgusted with their food moody miserable half hungry their outraged stomachs cursing and swearing and whining and supplicating all day long and in vain for they were the stomachs of fools then as i understand it your scheme is quite simple don't eat until you are hungry if the food fails to taste good fails to satisfy you rejoice you comfort you don't eat again until you are very hungry then it will rejoice you and do you good too and i am to observe no regularity as to ours when you are conquering a bad appetite no after it is conquered regularity is no harm so long as the appetite remains good as soon as the appetite wavers apply the corrective again which is starvation long or short according to the needs of the case the best diet i suppose i mean the wholesomest all diets are wholesome some are wholesomer than others but all the ordinary diets are wholesome enough for the people who use them whether the food be fine or coarse it will taste good and it will nourish if a watch be kept upon the appetite and a little starvation introduced every time it weakens nansan was used to fine fare but when his meals were restricted to bear meat months at a time he suffered no damage and no discomfort because his appetite was kept at par through the difficulty of getting his bear meat regularly but doctors arrange carefully considered and delicate diets for invalids they can't help it the invalid is full of inherited superstitions and won't starve himself he believes it would certainly kill him it would weaken him wouldn't it nothing to hurt look at the invalids in our shipwreck they lived fifteen days on pinches of raw ham a suck at tailor boots and general starvation it weakened them but it didn't hurt them it put them in fine shape to eat heartily of hearty food and build themselves up to a condition of robust health but they did not know enough to profit by that they lost their opportunity they remained invalids it served them right do you know the trick that the health resort doctors play what is it my system disguised covert starvation 
grape cure bath cure mud cure it is all the same the grape and the bath and the mud make a show and do a trifle of the work the real work is done by the surreptitious starvation the patient accustomed to four meals and late hours at both ends of the day now consider what he has to do at a health resort he gets up at six in the morning eats one egg tramps up and down a promenade two hours with the other fools eats a butterfly slowly drinks a glass of filtered sewage that smells like a buzzard's breath promenades another two hours but alone if you speak to him he says anxiously my water i am walking off my water please don't interrupt and goes stumping along again eats a candied rose-leaf lies at rest in the silence and solitude of his room for hours mustn't read mustn't smoke the doctor comes and feels of his heart now and his pulse and thumps his breast and his back and his stomach and listens for results through a penny flagellate then orders the man's bath half a degree Reaumur, cooler than yesterday after the bath another egg a glass of sewage at three or four in the afternoon and promenade solemnly with the other freaks dinner at six half a doughnut and a cup of tea walk again half past eight supper more butterfly at nine to bed six weeks of this regime think of it it starves a man out and puts him in splendid condition it would have the same effect in london new york jericho anywhere how long does it take to put a person in condition here it ought to take but a day or two but in fact it takes from one to six weeks according to the character and mentality of the patient how is that do you see that crowd of women playing football and boxing and jumping fences yonder they have been here six or seven weeks they are spectral poor weaklings when they came they were accustomed to nibbling at dainties and delicacies at set hours four times a day and they had no appetite for anything i questioned them and then locked them into their rooms the frailest ones to starve nine or ten hours the others twelve or fifteen before long they began to beg and indeed they suffered a good deal they complained of nausea headache and so on it was good to see them eat when the time was up they could not remember when the devouring of a meal had afforded them such rapture that was their word now then that ought to have ended their cure but it didn't they were free to go to any meals in the house and they chose their accustomed for within a day or two i had to interfere their appetites were weakening i made them knock out a meal that set them up again then they resumed the four i begged them to learn to knock out a meal themselves without waiting for me up to a fortnight ago they couldn't they really hadn't manhood enough but they were gaining it and now i think they are safe they drop out a meal every now and then of their own accord they are in fine condition now and they might safely go home i think uh, but their confidence is not quite perfect yet so they are waiting a while other cases are different oh yes sometimes a man learns the whole trick in a week learns to regulate his appetite and keep in perfect order learns to drop out a meal with frequency and not mind it but why drop the entire meal out why not a part of it it's a poor device and inadequate if the stomach doesn't call vigorously with a shout as you may say it is better not to pester it but just give it a real rest some people can eat more meals than others and still thrive there are all sorts of people and all sorts of appetites i will show you a man presently who was accustomed to nibble at eight meals a day it was beyond the proper gate of his appetite by two i have got him down to six a day now and he is all right and enjoys life how many meals do you affect per day formerly for twenty-two years a meal and a half during the past two years two and a half coffee in a roll at nine luncheon at one dinner at seven thirty or eight 
formerly a meal and a half that is coffee in a roll at nine dinner in the evening nothing between is that it yes why did you add a meal it was the family's idea they were uneasy they thought i was killing myself you found a meal and a half per day enough all through the twenty-two years plenty your present poor condition is due to the extra meal drop it out you are trying to eat oftener than your stomach demands you don't gain you lose you eat less food now in a day on two and a half meals than you formerly ate on one and a half true a good deal less for in those old days my dinner was a very sizable thing put yourself on the single meal a day now dinner for a few days till you secure a good sound regular trustworthy appetite then take to your one and a half permanently and don't listen to the family any more when you have any ordinary ailment particularly of a feverish sort eat nothing at all during twenty-four hours that will cure it it will cure the stubbornest cold in the head too no cold in the head can survive twenty-four hours unmodified starvation i know it i have proved it many a time end of at the appetite cure by mark twain read by john greenman edward mills and george benton a tale by mark twain these two were distantly related to each other seventh cousins or something of that sort while still babies they became orphans and were adopted by the brants a childless couple who quickly grew very fond of them the brants were always saying be pure honest sober industrious and considerate of others and success in life is assured now the children heard this repeated some thousands of times before they understood it they could repeat it themselves long before they could say the lord's prayer it was painted over the nursery door and was about the first thing they learned to read it was destined to be the unswerving rule of edward mills life sometimes the brants changed the wording a little and said be pure honest sober industrious considerate and you will never lack friends baby mills was a comfort to everybody about him when he wanted candy and could not have it he listened to reason and contented himself without it when baby benton wanted candy he cried for it until he got it baby mills took care of his toys baby benton always destroyed his in a very brief time and then made himself so insistently disagreeable that in order to have peace in the house little edward was persuaded to yield up his playthings to him when the children were a little older georgie became a heavy expense in one respect he took no care of his clothes consequently he shone frequently in new ones which was not the case with eddie the boys grew apace eddie was an increasing comfort georgie an increasing solicitude it was always sufficient to say in answer to eddie's petitions i would rather you would not do it meaning swimming skating picnicking burying circusing and all sorts of things which boys delight in but no answer was sufficient for georgie he had to be humored in his desires or he would carry them with a high hand naturally no boy got more swimming skating burying and so forth than he nobody ever had a better time the good brants did not allow the boys to play out after nine in summer evenings they were sent to bed at that hour eddie honorably remained but georgie usually slipped out of the window toward ten and enjoyed himself until midnight it seemed impossible to break georgie of this bad habit but the brants managed it at last by hiring him with apples and marbles to stay in the good brants gave all their time and attention to vain endeavors to regulate georgie they said with grateful tears in their eyes that eddie needed no efforts of theirs he was so good so considerate and in all ways so perfect 
by and by the boys were big enough to work so they were apprenticed to a trade edward went voluntarily george was coaxed and bribed edward worked hard and faithfully and ceased to be an expense to the good brants they praised him so did his master but george ran away and it cost mr brant both money and trouble to hunt him up and get him back by and by he ran away again more money and more trouble he ran away a third time and stole a few things to carry with him trouble and expense for mr brant once more and besides it was with the greatest difficulty that he succeeded in persuading the master to let the youth go unprosecuted for the theft edward worked steadily along and in time became a full partner in his master's business george did not improve he kept the loving hearts of his aged benefactors full of trouble and their hands full of inventive activities to protect him from ruin edward as a boy had interested himself in sunday schools debating societies penny missionary affairs anti-tobacco organizations anti-profanity associations and all such things as a man he was a quiet but steady and reliable help ere in the church the temperance societies and in all movements looking to the aiding and uplifting of men this excited no remark attracted no attention for it was his natural bent finally the old people died the will testified their loving pride in edward and left their little property to george because he needed it whereas owing to a bountiful providence such was not the case with edward the property was left to george conditionally he must buy out edward's partner with it else it must go to a benevolent organization called the prisoner's friend society the old people left a letter in which they begged their dear son edward to take their place and watch over george and help and shield him as they had done edward dutifully acquiesced and george became his partner in the business he was not a valuable partner he had been meddling with drink before he soon developed into a constant tippler now and his flesh and eyes showed the fact unpleasantly edward had been courting a sweet and kindly spirited girl for some time they loved each other dearly and but about this period george began to haunt her tearfully and imploringly and at last she went crying to edward and said her high and holy duty was plain before her she must not let her own selfish desires interfere with it she must marry poor george and reform him it would break her heart she knew it would and so on but duty was duty so she married george and edward's heart came very near breaking as well as her own however edward recovered and married another girl a very excellent one she was too children came to both families mary did her honest best to reform her husband but the contract was too large george went on drinking and by and by he fell to misusing her and the little ones sadly a great many good people strove with george they were always at it in fact but he calmly took such efforts as his due and their duty and did not mend his ways he added a vice presently that of secret gambling he got deeply in debt he borrowed money on the firm's credit as quietly as he could and carried the system so far and so successfully that one morning the sheriff took possession of the establishment and the two cousins found themselves penniless times were hard now and they grew worse edward moved his family into a garret and walked the streets day and night seeking work he begged for it but it was really not to be had he was astonished to see how soon his face became unwelcome he was astonished and hurt to see how quickly the ancient interest which people had had in him faded out and disappeared still he must get work so he swallowed his chagrin and toiled on in search of it at last he got a job carrying bricks up a ladder in a hod and was a grateful man in consequence but after that nobody knew him or cared anything about him 
he was not able to keep up his dues in the various moral organizations to which he belonged and had to endure the sharp pain of seeing himself brought under the disgrace of suspension but the faster edward died out of public knowledge and interest the faster george rose in them he was found lying ragged and drunk in the gutter one morning a member of the ladies temperance refuge fished him out took him in hand got up a subscription for him kept him sober a whole week then got a situation for him an account of it was published general attention was thus drawn to the poor fellow and a great many people came forward and helped him toward reform with their countenance and encouragement he did not drink a drop for two months and meantime was the pet of the good then he fell in the gutter and there was a general sorrow and lamentation but the noble sisterhood rescued him again they cleaned him up they fed him they listened to the mournful music of his repentances they got him his situation again an account of this also was published and the town was drowned in happy tears over the re-restoration of the poor beast and struggling victim of the fatal bowl a grand temperance revival was got up and after some rousing speeches had been made the chairman said impressively we are not about to call for signers and i think there is a spectacle in store for you which not many in this house will be able to view with dry eyes there was an eloquent pause and then george benton escorted by a red sash detachment of the ladies of the refuge stepped forward upon the platform and signed the pledge the air was rent with applause and everybody cried for joy everybody wrung the hand of the new convert when the meeting was over his salary was enlarged next day he was the talk of the town and its hero an account of it was published george benton fell regularly every three months but was faithfully rescued and wrought with every time and good situations were found for him finally he was taken around the country lecturing as a reformed drunkard and he had great houses and did an immense amount of good he was so popular at home and so trusted during his sober intervals that he was enabled to use the name of a principal citizen and get a large sum of money at the bank a mighty pressure was brought to bear to save him from the consequences of his forgery and it was partially successful he was sent up for only two years when at the end of a year the tireless efforts of the benevolent were crowned with success and he emerged from the penitentiary with a pardon in his pocket the prisoner's friend society met him at the door with a situation and a comfortable salary and all the other benevolent people came forward and gave him advice encouragement and help edward mills had once applied to the prisoner's friend society for a situation when in dire need but the question have you been a prisoner made brief work of his case while all these things were going on edward mills had been quietly making head against adversity he was still poor but was in receipt of a steady and sufficient salary as the respected and trusted cashier of a bank george benton never came near him and was never heard to inquire about him george got to indulging in long absences from the town there were ill reports about him but nothing definite one winter's night some masked burglars forced their way into the bank and found edward mills there alone they commanded him to reveal the combination so that they could get into the safe he refused they threatened his life he said his employers trusted him and he could not be traitor to that trust he could die if he must but while he lived he would be faithful he would not yield up the combination the burglars killed him the detectives hunted down the criminals the chief one proved to be george benton a wide sympathy was felt for the widow and orphans of the dead man and all the newspapers in the land begged that all the banks in the land would testify their appreciation of the fidelity and heroism of the murdered cashier by coming forward with a generous contribution of money in aid of his family now bereft of support the result was a mass of solid cash amounting to upward of five hundred dollars 
an average of nearly three-eighths of a cent for each bank in the Union. The cashier's own bank testified its gratitude by endeavoring to show, but humiliatingly failed in it, that the peerless servant's accounts were not square, and that he himself had knocked his brains out with a bludgeon to escape detection and punishment. George Benton was arraigned for trial. Then everybody seemed to forget the widow and orphans in their solicitude for poor George. Everything that money and influence could do was done to save him. But it all failed. He was sentenced to death. Straightway the governor was besieged with petitions for commutation or pardon. They were brought by tearful young girls, by sorrowful old maids, by deputations of pathetic widows, by shoals of impressive orphans. But no, the governor, for once, would not yield. Now George Benton experienced religion. The glad news flew all around. From that time forth his cell was always full of girls and women and fresh flowers. All the day long there was prayer and hymn-singing and thanksgiving and homilies and tears with never an interruption except an occasional five-minute intermission for refreshments. This sort of thing continued up to the very gallows, and George Benton went proudly home in the black cap before a wailing audience of the sweetest and best that the region could produce. His grave had fresh flowers on it every day for a while, and the headstone bore these words, under a hand pointing aloft, He has fought the good fight. The brave cashier's headstone has this inscription, Be pure, honest, sober, industrious, considerate, and you will never— Nobody knows who gave the order to leave it that way, but it was so given. The cashier's family are in stringent circumstances now, it is said. But no matter, a lot of appreciative people who were not willing that an act so brave and true as his should go unrewarded, have collected forty-two thousand dollars, and built a memorial church with it. End of Edward Mills and George Benton A Tale by Mark Twain. Read by John Greenman. Does the race of man love a lord? By Mark Twain. Often a quite assified remark becomes sanctified by use and petrified by custom. It is then a permanency, its term of activity, a geologic period. The day after the arrival of Prince Henry, I met an English friend, and he rubbed his hands and broke out with a remark that was charged to the brim with joy, joy that was evidently a pleasant salve to an old sore place. Many a time I've had to listen without retort to an old saying that is irritatingly true, and until now seemed to offer no chance for a return jibe. An Englishman does dearly love a lord. But after this I shall talk back and say, How about the Americans? It is a curious thing, the currency that an idiotic saying can get. The man that first says it thinks he has made a discovery. The man he says it to thinks the same. It departs on its travels, is received everywhere with admiring acceptance, and not only as a piece of rare and acute observation, but as being exhaustively true and profoundly wise. And so it presently takes its place in the world's list of recognized and established wisdoms, and after that no one thinks of examining it to see whether it is really entitled to its high honors or not. I call to mind instances of this in two well-established proverbs, whose dullness is not surpassed by the one about the Englishman and his love for a lord. One of them records the American's adoration of the almighty dollar, the other the American millionaire girl's ambition to trade cash for a title, with a husband thrown in. It isn't merely the American that adores the almighty dollar, it is the human race. 
the human race has always adored the hatful of shells or the bale of calico or the half bushel of brass rings or the handful of steel fish hooks or the houseful of black wives or the zareba full of cattle or the two-score camels and asses or the factory or the farm or the block of buildings or the railroad bonds or the bank stock or the hoarded cash or anything that stands for wealth and consideration and independence and can secure to the possessor that most precious of all things another man's envy it was a dull person that invented the idea that the american's devotion to the dollar is more strenuous than another's rich american girls do buy titles but they did not invent that idea it had been worn threadbare several hundred centuries before america was discovered european girls still exploit it as briskly as ever and when a title is not to be had for the money in hand they buy the husband without it they must put up the dot or there is no trade the commercialization of brides is substantially universal except in america it exists with us to some little extent but in no degree approaching a custom the englishman dearly loves a lord what is the soul and source of his love i think the thing could be more correctly worded the human race dearly envies a lord that is to say it envies the lord's place why on two accounts i think its power and its conspicuousness where conspicuousness carries with it a power which by the light of our own observation and experience we are able to measure and comprehend i think our envy of the possessor is as deep and as passionate as is that of any other nation no one can care less for a lord than the backwoodsman who has had no personal contact with lords and has seldom heard them spoken of but i will not allow that any englishman has a profounder envy of a lord than has the average american who has lived long years in a european capital and fully learned how immense is the position the lord occupies of any ten thousand americans who eagerly gather at vast inconvenience to get a glimpse of prince henry all but a couple of hundred will be there out of an immense curiosity they are burning up with desire to see a personage who is so much talked about they envy him but it is conspicuousness they envy mainly not the power that is lodged in his royal quality and position for they have but a vague and spectral knowledge and appreciation of that through their environment and associations they have been accustomed to regard such things lightly and as not being very real consequently they are not able to value them enough to consumingly envy them but whenever an american or other human being is in the presence for the first time of a combination of great power and conspicuousness which he thoroughly understands and appreciates his eager curiosity and pleasure will be well sodden with that other passion envy whether he suspect it or not at any time on any day in any part of america you can confer a happiness upon any passing stranger by calling his attention to any other passing stranger and saying do you see that gentleman going along there it is mr rockefeller watch his eye it is a combination of power and conspicuousness which the man understands when we understand rank we always like to rub against it when a man is conspicuous we always want to see him also if he will pay us an attention we will manage to remember it also we will mention it now and then casually sometimes to a friend or if a friend is not handy we will make out with a stranger well then what is rank and what is conspicuousness at once we think of kings and 
aristocracies and of world-wide celebrities in soldierships the arts letters etc and we stop there but that is a mistake rank holds its court and receives its homage on every round of the ladder from the emperor down to the rat-catcher and distinction also exists on every round of the ladder and commands its due of deference and envy to worship rank and distinction is the dear and valued privilege of all the human race and it is freely and joyfully exercised in democracies as well as in monarchies and even to some extent among those creatures whom we impertinently call the lower animals for even they have some poor little vanities and foibles though in this matter they are paupers as compared to us a chinese emperor has the worship of his four hundred million of subjects but the rest of the world is indifferent to him a christian emperor has the worship of his subjects and of a large part of the christian world outside of his dominions but he is a matter of indifference to all china a king class a has an extensive worship a king class b has a less extensive worship class c class d class e get a steadily diminishing share of worship class l sultan of zanzibar class p sultan of zulu and class w half king of samoa get no worship at all outside their own little patch of sovereignty take the distinguished people along down each has his group of homage payers in the navy there are many groups they start with the secretary and the admiral and go down to the quartermaster and below for there will be groups among the sailors and each of these groups will have a tar who is distinguished for his battles or his strength or his daring or his profanity and is admired and envied by his group the same with the army the same with the literary and journalistic craft the publishing craft the cod fishery craft standard oil u s steel the class a hotel and the rest of the alphabet in that line the class a prize fighter and the rest of the alphabet in his line clear down to the lowest and obscurest six-boy gang of little gamins with its one boy that can trash the rest and to whom he is king of samoa bottom of the royal race but looked up to with a most ardent admiration and envy there is something pathetic and funny and pretty about this human race's fondness for contact with power and distinction and for the reflected glory it gets out of it the king class a is happy in the state banquet and the military show which the emperor provides for him and he goes home and gathers the queen and the princelings around him in the privacy of the spare-room and tells them all about it and says his imperial majesty put his hand on my shoulder in the most friendly way just as friendly and familiar oh you can't imagine it and everybody seeing him do it charming perfectly charming the king class g is happy in the cold collation and the police parade provided for him by the king class b and goes home and tells the family all about it and says and his majesty took me into his own private cabinet for a smoke and a chat and there we sat just as sociable and talking away and laughing and chatting just the same as if we had been born in the same bunk and all the servants in the ante-room could see us doing it oh it was too lovely for anything the king class q is happy in the modest entertainment furnished him by the king class m and goes home and tells the household about it and is as grateful and joyful over it as were his predecessors in the gaudier attentions that had fallen to their larger lot emperors kings artisans peasants big people little people at bottom we are all alike and all the same all just alike on the inside and when our clothes are off nobody can tell which of us is which we are unanimous in the pride we take in good and genuine compliments paid us in distinctions conferred upon us in attentions shown us there is not one of us from the emperor down but is made like that do i mean attentions shown us by the great 
no i mean simply flattering attentions let them come whence they may we despise no source that can pay us a pleasing attention there is no source that is humble enough for that you have heard a dear little girl say to a frowsy and disreputable dog he came right to me and let me pat him on the head and he wouldn't let the others touch him and you have seen her eyes dance with pride in that high distinction you have often seen that if the child were a princess would that random dog be able to confer the like glory upon her with his pretty compliment yes and even in her mature life and seated upon a throne she would still remember it still remark it still speak of it with frank satisfaction that charming and lovable german princess and poet carmen silva queen of romania remembers yet that the flowers of the woods and fields talked to her when she was a girl and she sets it down in her latest book and that the squirrels conferred upon her and her father the valued compliment of not being afraid of them and once one of them holding a nut between its sharp little teeth ran right up against my father it has the very note of he came right to me and let me pat him on the head and when it saw itself reflected in his boot it was very much surprised and stopped for a long time to contemplate itself in the polished leather then it went its way and the birds she still remembers with pride that they came boldly into my room when she had neglected her duty and put no food on the window-sill for them she knew all the wild birds and forgets the royal crown on her head to remember with pride that they knew her also that the wasp and the bee were personal friends of hers and never forgot that gracious relationship to her injury never have i been stung by a wasp or a bee and here is that proud note again that sings in that little girl's elation in being singled out among all the company of children for the random dog's honor conferring attentions even in the worst summer for wasps when in lunching out of doors our table was covered with them and every one else was stung they never hurt me when a queen whose qualities of mind and heart and character are able to add distinction to so distinguished a place as a throne remembers with grateful exultation after thirty years honors and distinctions conferred upon her by the humble wild creatures of the forest we are helped to realize that complimentary attentions homage distinctions are of no caste but are above all caste that they are a nobility conferring power apart we all like these things when the gate guard at the railway station passes me through unchallenged and examines other people's tickets i feel as the king class a felt when the emperor put the imperial hand on his shoulder everybody seeing him do it and as the child felt when the random dog allowed her to pat his head and ostracize the others and as the princess felt when the wasp spared her and stung the rest and i felt just so four years ago in vienna and remember it yet when the helmeted police shut me off with fifty others from a street which the emperor was to pass through and the captain of the squad turned and saw the situation and said indignantly to that guard can't you see it is the heir mark twain let him through it was four years ago but it will be four hundred before i forget the wind of self-complacency that rose in me and strained my buttons when i marked the deference for me evoked in the faces of my fellow rabble and noted mingled with it a puzzled and resentful expression which said as plainly as speech could have worded it and who in the nation is the heir mark twain um gottes willen how many times in your life have you heard this boastful remark i stood as close to him as i am to you i could have put out my hand and touched him we have all heard it many and many a time 
it was a proud distinction to be able to say those words it brought envy to the speaker a kind of glory and he basked in it and was happy through all his veins and who was it he stood so close to the answer would cover all the grades sometimes it was a king sometimes it was a renowned highwayman sometimes it was an unknown man killed in an extraordinary way and made suddenly famous by it always it was a person who was for the moment the subject of public interest the public interest of a nation maybe only the public interest of a village i was there and i saw it myself that is a common and envy-compelling remark it can refer to a battle to a hanging to a coronation to the killing of jumbo by the railway train to the arrival of jenny lind at the battery to the meeting of the president and prince henry to the chase of a murderous maniac to the disaster in the tunnel to the explosion in the subway to a remarkable dog-fight to a village church struck by lightning it will be said more or less casually by everybody in america who has seen prince henry do anything or try to the man who was absent and didn't see him do anything will scoff it is his privilege and he can make capital out of it too he will seem even to himself to be different from other americans and better as his opinion of his superior americanism grows and swells and concentrates and coagulates he will go further and try to belittle the distinction of those that saw the prince do things and will spoil their pleasure in it if he can my life has been embittered by that kind of persons if you are able to tell of a special distinction that has fallen to your lot it gravels them they cannot bear it and they try to make believe that the thing you took for a special distinction was nothing of the kind and was meant in quite another way once i was received in private audience by an emperor last week i was telling a jealous person about it and i could see him wince under it see it bite see him suffer i revealed the whole episode to him with considerable elaboration and nice attention to detail when i was through he asked me what had impressed me most i said his majesty's delicacy they told me to be sure and back out from the presence and find the doorknob as best i could it was not allowable to face around now the emperor knew it would be a difficult ordeal for me because of lack of practice and so when it was time to part he turned with exceeding delicacy and pretended to fumble with things on his desk so that i could get out in my own way without his seeing me it went home it was vitriol i saw the envy and disgruntlement rise in the man's face he couldn't keep it down i saw him trying to fix up something in his mind to take the bloom off that distinction i enjoyed that for i judged that he had his work cut out for him he struggled along inwardly for quite a while then he said with the manner of a person who has to say something and hasn't anything relevant to say you said he had a handful of special brand cigars lying on the table yes i never saw anything to match them i had him again he had to fumble around in his mind as much as another minute before he could play then he said in as mean a way as i ever heard a person say anything he could have been counting the cigars you know i cannot endure a man like that it is nothing to him how unkind he is so long as he takes the bloom off it is all he cares for an englishman or other human being does dearly love a lord or other conspicuous person it includes us all we love to be noticed by the conspicuous person we love to be associated with such or with a conspicuous event even in a seventh-rate fashion even in a forty-seventh if we cannot do better this accounts for some of our curious tastes in mementos it accounts for the large private trade in the prince of wales hair 
which chambermaids were able to drive in that article of commerce when the prince made the tour of the world in the long ago hair which probably did not always come from his brush since enough of it was marketed to refurnish a bald comet it accounts for the fact that the rope which lynches a negro in the presence of ten thousand christian spectators is saleable five minutes later at two dollars an inch it accounts for the mournful fact that a royal personage does not venture to wear buttons on his coat in public we do love a lord and by that term i mean any person whose situation is higher than our own the lord of a group for instance a group of peers a group of millionaires a group of hoodlums a group of sailors a group of newsboys a group of saloon politicians a group of college girls no royal person has ever been the object of a more delirious loyalty and slavish adoration than is paid by the vast tammany herd to its squalid idol of wantage there is not a bifurcated animal in that menagerie that would not be proud to appear in a newspaper picture in his company at the same time there are some in that organization who would scoff at the people who have been daily pictured in company with prince henry and would say vigorously that they would not consent to be photographed with him a statement which would not be true in any instance there are hundreds of people in america who would frankly say to you that they would not be proud to be photographed in a group with the prince if invited and some of these unthinking people would believe it when they said it yet in no instance would it be true we have a large population but we have not a large enough one by several millions to furnish that man he has not yet been begotten and in fact he is not begettable you may take any of the printed groups and there isn't a person in it who isn't visibly glad to be there there isn't a person in the dim background who isn't visibly trying to be vivid if it is a crowd of ten thousand ten thousand proud untamed democrats horny-handed sons of toil and of politics and flyers of the eagle there isn't one who isn't conscious of the camera there isn't one who is trying to keep out of range there isn't one who isn't plainly meditating a purchase of the paper in the morning with the intention of hunting himself out in the picture and of framing and keeping it if he shall find so much of his person in it as his starboard ear we all love to get some of the drippings of conspicuousness and we will put up with a single humble drip if we can't get any more we may pretend otherwise in conversation but we can't pretend it to ourselves privately and we don't we do confess in public that we are the noblest work of god being moved to it by long habit and teaching and superstition but deep down in the secret places of our souls we recognize that if we are the noblest work the less said about it the better we of the north poke fun at the south for its fondness for titles a fondness for titles pure and simple regardless of whether they are genuine or pinchbeck we forget that whatever a southerner likes the rest of the human race likes and that there is no law of predilection lodged in one people that is absent from another people there is no variety in the human race we are all children all children of the one adam and we love toys we can soon acquire that southern disease if someone will give it a start it already has a start in fact i have been personally acquainted with over eighty four thousand persons who at one time or another in their lives have served for a year or two on the staffs of our multitudinous governors and through that fatality have been generals temporarily and colonels temporarily and judge advocates temporarily but i have known only nine among them who could be hired to let the title go when it ceased to be legitimate i know thousands and thousands of governors who ceased to be governors away back in the last century but i am acquainted with only three who would answer your letter if you failed to call them governor in it 
i know acres and acres of men who have done time in a legislature in prehistoric days but among them is not half an acre whose resentment you would not raise if you addressed them as mr instead of honorable the first thing a legislature does is to convene in an impressive legislative attitude and get itself photographed each member frames his copy and takes it to the woods and hangs it up in the most aggressively conspicuous place in his house and if you visit the house and fail to inquire what that accumulation is the conversation will be brought around to it by that aforetime legislator and he will show you a figure in it which in the course of years he has almost obliterated with the smut of his finger marks and say with a solemn joy it's me have you ever seen a country congressman enter the hotel breakfast-room in washington with his letters and sit at his table and let on to read them and wrinkle his brows and frown statesmanlike keeping a furtive watch out over his glasses all the while to see if he is being observed and admired those same old letters which he fetches in every morning have you seen it have you seen him show off it is the sight of the national capital except one a pathetic one that is the ex-congressman the poor fellow whose life has been ruined by a two-year taste of glory and of fictitious consequence who has been superseded and ought to take his heartbreak home and hide it but cannot tear himself away from the scene of his lost little grandeur and so he lingers and still lingers year after year unconsidered sometimes snubbed ashamed of his fallen estate and valiantly trying to look otherwise dreary and depressed but counterfeiting breeziness and gaiety hailing with chummy familiarity which is not always welcomed the more fortunates who are still in place and were once his mates have you seen him he clings piteously to the one little shred that is left of his departed distinction the privilege of the floor and works it hard and gets what he can out of it that is the saddest figure i know of yes we do so love our little distinctions and then we loftily scoff at a prince for enjoying his larger ones forgetting that if we only had his chance ah senator is not a legitimate title a senator has no more right to be addressed by it than have you or i but in the several state capitals and in washington there are five thousand senators who take very kindly to that fiction and who purr gratefully when you call them by it which you may do quite unrebuked then those same senators smile at the self-constructed majors and generals and judges of the south indeed we do love our distinctions get them how we may and we work them for all they are worth in prayer we call ourselves worms of the dust but it is only on a sort of tacit understanding that the remark shall not be taken at par we worms of the dust oh no we are not that except in fact and we do not deal much in fact when we are contemplating ourselves as a race we do certainly love a lord let him be crocker or duke or a prize-fighter or whatever other personage shall chance to be the head of our group many years ago i saw a greasy youth in overall standing by the herald office with an expectant look in his face soon a large man passed out and gave him a pat on the shoulder that was what the boy was waiting for the large man's notice the pat made him proud and happy and the exultation inside of him shone out through his eyes and his mates were there to see the pat and envy it and wish they could have that glory the boy belonged down cellar in the press-room the large man was king of the upper floors foreman of the composing room the light in the boy's face was worship the foreman was his lord head of his group the pat was an accolade it was as precious to the boy as it would have been if he had been an aristocrat's son and the accolade had been delivered by his sovereign with a sword 
the quintessence of the honor was all there there was no difference in values in truth there was no difference present except an artificial one clothes all the human race loves a lord that is it loves to look upon or be noticed by the possessor of power or conspicuousness and sometimes animals born to be better things and higher ideals descend to man's level in this matter in the jardin des plantes i have seen a cat that was so vain of being the personal friend of an elephant that i was ashamed of her End of does the race of man love a lord by mark twain end of mark twain's journal writings volume three read by john greenman